Welcome everyone to the session, The Successful Strategies for Telework and Hybrid Work Environments. So unless otherwise noted, no statement during today's workshop should be construed as an official position of any federal agency. Support for today's event is coming from ARC Magic, um, who's providing event day logistics, and as well as GSA Digital Gov University, also providing event day logistics and the webinar platform today. And here's my, my bio here. I'm from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and Health and Human Services. And I just wanted to start off with a really quick overview of what the Federal Leadership and Professional Development Seminar Series is. So it's a cross-agency seminar series on leadership and professional development topics. Uh, it provides an avenue to bring folks together, provide free training, and also share federal leader expertise and successful strategies. So it was actually started four years ago now, which I can't believe. Uh, speakers come from across the government and aud the audiences, um, all levels of federal employees. Currently attendance is remote only. Seminars happen every few months. It's not a funded program and there's no attendee cost or payment to speakers. So uh, speaker, the, sorry, the seminar series goals, um, they are connection between federal employees and with federal communities of practice sharing federal expertise, lessons learned, and successful strategies, professional development opportunities without fees for all levels of federal employees, problem solving for common hurdles, access to seminar series resources and other learning opportunities, and partnership with and promotion of similar events. The vision of the seminar series is to build, retain, connect, a more collaborative and engaged and capable workforce with the tools and expertise needed to more efficiently and effectively serve the public and ultimately go further faster together. So amazingly, we've had about 18,000 registrants so far for the seminar series seminars. Attendees per seminar range between 350 and 1500 folks. And um, each seminar, there are about 40 to 60 agencies in the audience. GS levels range um, from all GS levels actually um, through SES. The listserv subscribers, excuse me, for the seminar series are around 5,500 now. There are 27 uh, seminar recordings on max.gov. The YouTube channel has 21 videos and it's had over 11,000 views and there are um, over 500 uh, YouTube channel subscribers. In the audience today, we have over 80 agencies attending. I just wanted to pause for a second so folks can see who's in the audience. And it's uh, amazing to see the, the big um, group across the government here today. And I just wanted to extend another welcome to everyone. So we're gonna start off our, our first poll. Gabby, if you can start the first poll, just to see from which region are you working? I know that not everyone has access to the polls. So folks that are calling in um, or, or folks that just, um, can't get to the, the poll through their system. But the first uh, choice is Northeast. The second choice is South. The third choice is Midwest. The next one is West, then US territories. And last is international. And folks have asked, where would DC be? That would be um, Northeast. So I see some folks are putting it in the chat and some are, um, some are actually going through the, the poll. And just seeing a lot of answers in the chat from folks coming from all over. And Gabby, you can go ahead and close the poll. So we have uh, folks from, from Northeast, South, Midwest, West, and US territories with a predominant number of, of folks coming from the Northeast. Thanks so much for everyone um, participating in that. Just going back to, here we go. So for more information about the seminar series, uh, one big announcement is that there is a new website for the seminar series on max.gov. So you can just log in to max.gov. It's a, it's a quick login to sign up for max.gov and the seminar series uh, past recordings and materials are listed here. Uh, also, uh, there's a YouTube channel that has links to many of the seminar recordings. You can join the listserv for announcements. And then if any questions, um, my email address is listed here. You all have the slides, so I'll just go by this quickly. Ground rules for today is engage, engage, engage. And you all are doing a great job already chatting in, um, answering questions on chat. Uh, if you're connected by phone only, or if you don't have access through Zoom, um, please feel free to send comments and questions after the seminar um, by email, and you all have my email address as well. 
So the other, the other piece here is making this a safe and productive environment, having a positive focus on learning and on actionable strategies, respectful of fellow feds and agencies, and being patient with any uh, potential IT hiccups. So let's get started. So today, again, we're going to be talking about successful strategies for telework and hybrid work environments. We're going to start off with an introduction, uh, level setting, just giving definitions and talking a bit about the history and then benefits and risks and challenges of increased telework and hybrid work. And then we're going to be moving into a two hour uh, session of expert presentations on strategies and tools to overcome challenges and achieve success. So starting off with the introduction. So uh, for the definition of telework, what is it? So this definition comes from telework.gov. Uh, tele comes from the Greek word meaning from a distance. And um, at its core, and I quote, telework is people doing their work at different locations different from where they would normally be doing it. I just want to note this presentation is focused on telework for duties such as administrative work that can be performed remotely rather than on duties such as, for example, fixing some type of equipment that cannot be done uh, remotely. So I just wanted to make that clear at the very beginning. Uh, regarding the hybrid workforce, that includes a combination of workers that are on site and those that are teleworking. Also wanted to include here, this is from the GSA uh, Telework Toolbox, work is what you do, not where you are. So now we're going to go back and look a bit at the history of telework. And I, I think it's nice to, to look at the past before we look at where we are and where we might be going. Uh, there's actually a, a really rich history of, of telework, and this leads us to our first poll, <laughs> our second poll, actually, first poll in the presentation. But second poll here, Gabby, if you can get this one started. Uh, which year did telework start in the federal government? The first choice is 1934. Next is 1956. Then 1935, or sorry, 1975 is the third choice. And 1992. So just leaving that open for a bit to see what folks think about that. So again, 1934, 1956, 1975, and 1992. And there are some folks that can't see the full option depending on how they logged into Zoom. So please do feel free to chat in your answer. So I see a whole host of answers. Some are 92, some are 34, 56. And Gabby, you can go ahead and, and um, close that poll and see the answers here. Uh, it's very interesting. Everyone has a range of answers, but the predominant um, folks here think that uh, telework started in the government in 1992. It turns out telework started in 1934. I was actually very surprised to see this. So in 2000, GSA released Dr. Wendell Joyce, uh, Joyce's uh, book on the evolution or paper on the evolution of telework in the federal government. And uh, one of the quotes from that I think is really great. The history of federal telework reflects the evolution of one of the most significant and progressive changes in work conditions for federal employees. And so in 1934, NCUA examiners teleworked full time. In fact, they never worked on site. They would go in and do their examinations and come home and write their reports. So it's very interesting. It, that was how it was set up in the very beginning and that was their standard. And it's still done that way today. In 1957, the Comptroller General approved telework on a case-by-case -case basis. Then in the 1960s, uh, one of the teleworkers that was approved was Jack Niles, and he's considered to be the father of telework. He was an Air Force space program rocket scientist who was teleworking from LA. And he did a bunch of research on telework and a lot of work in promoting the value and importance of telework uh, and did a lot of research with National Science Foundation. And in 1973, he coined the words telecommuting and teleworking. In 1979, uh, Frank Schiff, uh, the chief economics for Economist, I'm sorry, for CED also provided a bunch of input into the uh, into telework research and OPM uh, conducted uh, telework pilots, which involved five agencies and these initial pilots yielded favorable results. So that's up to 1979 now. In 1980, there were a couple 18 month telework pilots by NIH and the Army, and these also yielded positive results. Uh, but the program actually was ended due to concern about potential criticism and risk of fraud and abuse. 
1989, so there was kind of a, a span of not a lot of movement in telework. Um, in 1989, a few more things happened, but one of the biggest things that happened in 1989 was the earthquake in, in California that displaced many EPA employees and led to over 700 EPA employees teleworking. And despite the difficulties due to the unplanned nature, um, most of the managers and staff wanted to continue the telework program. Then the year later in 1990 was the first congressional funding for telework, and this was reinstated in years to follow. GSA and OPM uh, implemented their uh, Federal Flexible Workplace or FlexiPlace pilot that year. And I'll be talking more about that later and, and what the results were for that. In 1996, law empowered GSA to create teleworking centers, produce telework guidance and provide uh, um, assistance and oversight. And then in 1999, there was additional funding for telework programs. So in 2000 to 2005, there were additional requirements and, and uh, guidance that happened. So there was additional requirements for agencies to establish telework policies and reporting to OPM and also establishing telework coordinators. Then moving on to 2006, uh, GSA actually released some guidelines for agencies to consider certain factors when deciding if telework might meet their, their needs. So some of the factors they, uh, they suggested considering included uh, space utilization, quality of work life performance, uh, cost savings, and environmental impact. So moving on from 2006 to 2010 and President Obama's era, there was the Telework Enhancement Act that came out and this act actually uh, had a lot of policy within it. It required uh, creating telework policy, telework managing officers, also telework training, and uh, for folks to sign telework agreements that could be terminated if the agreement was violated or if the employee didn't maintain a certain uh, performance standard. It required a uh, COOP or continuity of operation plans to include an aspect of telework uh, it provided guide, guidelines for OPM annual reporting requirements, and it also required the OMB director to work with NIST to issue guidelines to ensure the adequacy of information and security protection of information and information systems used while teleworking. And for OPM to work with various agencies, including NARA for record management, FEMA for COOP, and GSA in the area of telework centers, travel, technology, equipment, etc. So with all of this that happened, <laughs> what, what was the impact? What did folks find? So going back to the FlexiPlace uh, pilot that happened in 1990, in this pilot they found that over 90% of supervisors and over 95% of participants perceive performance to be the same or better than non-telework performance levels. Also, 45% of participants use less sick leave. In this report, OPM also concluded um, a quote here, uh, they, that telework was a, pro was a promising mechanism for reducing federal operating and healthcare costs. It had indications of improving job performance, reduced sick leave, improving health, reducing vehicle usage, and also the cost was seen to be minimal to the organization and uh, more than 80% of supervisors uh, saw no additional costs at all. I wanted to also add a, a quote when um, the National Performance Review of 93 was reporting about this pilot. They also added a quote that I thought was very interesting. And I'll just read it here. The federal government should be viewed as a model employer in the availability and flexibility of quality of work life programs that emphasize the tools employees at all levels need to manage their work responsibilities and personal lives more effectively, end of quote. And I think that's a, a, great, um, a great reminder that just as far as uh, US government serving as a model. So then fast forward to FY19 data presented in the in OPM's 2020 report to Congress. And in this report, they um, tell workers recorded higher engagement, higher overall satisfaction, and intent to stay than non-teleworkers. Um, I quote here, research has identified a significant and positive relationship between telework and job performance, both with supervisory performance ratings and objective performance criteria. It also noted other uses of telework, including the COOP again, uh, increasing retention, and supporting employees with medical needs. And then 2020 hit, and we all know what happened in 2020 with the start of the pandemic. And this led from full-time telework jumping from 3% to 59%. 
and, and what happened. This was kind of the largest unplanned pilot study. Uh, so what were the consequences here? One of the things that happened uh, because of the pandemic was that there was an increase of work for many employees. Actually, 48% of folks did note an increase in work. The workplace effectiveness scores, however, um, remained high uh, but were, and were just slightly reduced during the pandemic, so um, by 3 to 8%. So the federal employee viewpoint scores, so this is the viewpoint scores uh, reflecting back on, on the year 2020, they were actually the highest in five years for overall engagement, overall global satisfaction, leadership and management practices that contribute to agency performance, um, and it also employee satisfaction in a, in a number of areas. And I just want to pause here to see if anyone has any questions. I know that a lot of, a lot of, uh, Points have been flying by, and I see I see a lot of chats coming in. And just want to see if everyone can hear me okay. Just pausing, pausing for a second. Hi, Kim. It's Gabby from Digital Gov. Mm -hmm. Just to let you know that your audio um, and video um, sound great. Thank you. Okay, great. I'll, I'll keep on moving. I do see some questions, and I will um, get to those at the and as long as I have time, and if not, I will, I will answer those questions later. But I just want to go over some of the organizational benefits that we're seeing. So uh, you talked a little bit about this already. Organizational performance remained high. Uh, the new ways were found to connect, collaborate, and do work through technology. Uh, we saw improved retention, reduced absenteeism, reduced operating costs, uh, improved federal uh, emergency preparedness, and also more competitive uh, hiring. So the ability to stay competitive uh, and also using telework as a non-monetary incentive and the ability to potentially hire uh, the best employees from across the country, especially if remote work, uh, for example, is allowed. Uh, improved retention, uh, teleworking employees are less likely to leave and um, some employees that may have been considering retirement or leaving um, might otherwise stay uh, with, with teleworking as an option. So some of the risks for organizations, uh, one is the safety of a home work site may pose a risk of injuries. There's information security risks, and that's something that I'm, I'm not going to really be touching on much today because there have been a host of, of federal workshops on information security, but definitely something that's very important. Also relationship building, collaboration, and staff cohesion may be more difficult and it needs to be more intentional. And engagement is another aspect that must be more intentional. Um, another thing is meeting fatigue is real. Meetings are easier to convene electronically, and this is a risk as, as well as a benefit. Uh, potential retention risk as well, just the fact that uh, folks could be more mobile and, and be able to, um, to leave and go to other agencies as well. I'm going to cover some of the financial impact on agencies. So some of the cost savings include a reduction in transit subsidies and travel subsidies, uh, sometimes reduction in real estate space and, and rental space for there's some agencies who have considered uh, offering folks the ability to give up their office and in those those agencies, uh, then there might be a reduction in lease space, for example, uh, reduced costs for parking, utilities, office supplies, bathroom and kitchen supplies, maintenance, and also employee absences. Additional expenses for agencies include a new technology costs for more advanced technology with larger capacity for things like media and instant messaging, shared drives, et cetera, and then also the training associated with this new technology. Another cost is shipping, so shipping for equipment and materials. Financial impact on employees, um, some of these include uh, re, you know, cost saving reduction, so in uh, re reduced expenses for transit expenses, wear and tear on the vehicle, uh, sometimes reduce food expenses and not eating out, and sometimes also reduce clothing expenses, for example, not having to um, invest in as much office clothing. As far as uh, potential additional expenses for employees, um, some of those may include utilities, additional utilities expenses, office supplies, furniture, and technologies such as Wi-Fi boosters, printers, and extra monitors. I want to also touch on the impact on diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. And some of the benefits that we've seen has been remote at work, 
allows hiring from the best candidates from across the country. And this can allow increased diversity in thought and, and perspective and also geographic diversity, potentially increased generational diversity. Also, um, telework supports employees with disabilities, especially those who experience difficulties with commuting and traveling or who need special environments. Some of the challenges associated with um, diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. One is that remotely working folks can feel marginalized and that they're not seen and heard. Uh, there are potentially reduced pathways, especially during full-time telework for hiring entry-level positions. There's the potential for exclusion, um, especially in hybrid environments where uh, the, the folks that are, are not uh, seen and in person uh, may be recognized less. And the intentional, the need for intentional effort and innovation to make sure everyone is included and, and materials are accessible. Like for example, supervisors needing to be intentional about um, providing and receiving feedback uh, from all employees and also uh, methods of engagement and communication needing to be accessible and, and meeting Section 508. Some additional uh, employee impact from telework. Uh, some find fewer distractions at home and some find more distractions at home. Uh, there's time saved from commuting to uh, meetings and trainings that can now be done virtually. And the saved time could be used for additional work, which is also an employee, uh, employer benefit. Uh, the risk is that downtime and breaks uh, such as this must now be intentional and folks uh, have to make an effort then to avoid scheduling back-to-back -back meetings. Time and energy saved during decreased commuting time can be redirected to other activities. I'm going to go into this a little bit more, but just um, more energy for work time and, and time for other things like volunteering, time with family and friends, and other health-related activities. There's money that's, that's saved as well for commuting. And, and I just want to note that some employees just um, also find a, additional value with, with spending uh, time with their pets. So what are the other aspects on uh, impacts on employee health and well-being? So uh, some of the benefits I wanted to mention, in 2015, there was a study that came out that noted a reduced risk of depression, obesity, alcohol abuse, physical inactivity, and tobacco use for uh, teleworkers. And the 2018 OPM report to Congress also noted um, for 58% of teleworkers, there was improved health. And for 67% of teleworkers, there was also improved stress management. Some of the risk included um, uneven work-life balance. I think this is, um, this is definitely a problem a lot of folks have faced with the invisible barrier now between work and home. And um, due to the pandemic, there's also some increased expectation and workload as well, which has led to um, some long hours and burnout for folks. Uh, additional family time has been difficult for families that are experiencing issues. There's a risk of increased isolation. And the difficulty now of maintaining connections and establishing new connections, uh, because some of the unintentional encounters like hallway chats uh, are, are not happening anymore, so it has to definitely be an intentional effort. So I just wanted to focus a little bit, um, just to dive in a little bit more deeply into reduced commuting and the impact not only on the employees, but also on the, on the public. And I uh, just wanted to say for, for the less commute time, uh, especially in areas like the DC metro area with, um, with, with really long commutes. And DC, unfortunately, has been consistently in the top 10 of America's worst and longest commutes. Uh, it really does have an impact to have less, less commute time, um, not only on, on the employees, but on the, the public as well when less people are commuting. And, and just as an example, I know when some of the telework had been reduced, and just as a personal example, I had it an increase in my commute time of 15 minutes, which doesn't really sound like much, but you think about it and that's half an hour a day. And over time, it ends up being five days in a year. And so it's just, uh, it's just interesting to see the, um, the impact of, of how, if some, some folks are changing their, their policies and there are more people on the road, then it really does um, roll over into the rest of the public that are in that metro area. And so if you, don't, if you don't have that commute time, there's more, more time for other activities, such as exercising, spending time with family and friends, other activities, volunteering, for example, um, and also having less sedentary commute time is really great for folks that are using vehicular transportation. And this also has a big impact on health. 
So as far as the re reduced commuting have an impact on, on transportation infrastructure, um, there are some risks involved. So lower funds received from tolls and public transportation ridership as well. The benefits include reduced wear and tear on the transportation system. So what else happens when there is less vehicular traffic? This picture to me is, is really striking. So this picture here is a picture of LA taken on June 11th of 2019. And this was a moderate air quality day in LA. And this is in contrast, this picture here is April 7 of 2020. And this is the height of the lockdown, just showing the, the difference in air quality with the, with the different levels of, of transportation um, and different levels of people on the road. And the Metro DC area summer of 2020 had the lowest recorded pollution level. So zero code red days, which are, are the days unhealthy for everyone and two code orange days, which are the orange days are the ones that are, are unhealthy for sensitive groups. And this compares to 10 days in 2019 and 48 days in 2010. So uh, one of the important things about uh, air pollution is just linked to a lot of uh, health impact, including uh, respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, maternal uh, and fetal illness and, and mortality, uh, cancer, and also neurological disease. In addition to air quality, there are other environmental uh, effects as well, including reduced, as far as telework goes, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and also energy conservation, including reduced energy conser conservation, or, sorry, reduced energy consumption at federal facilities, and, um, and also reduced fuel consumption. But there are still some concerns about telework. And I, I think of one of the aspects of, of this, I really think is, is really kind of in tune to the, the old age, or sorry, age old <laughs> philosophical question. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it really make a sound? And I think this is really a good analogy to if an employee works, but they are not seen by their supervisor, does their supervisor know that they worked and how much they did and how well they did it? And do they remember them when opportunities arise? And I think this really gets at concerns by both the supervisor and by the em employee. In uh, OPM's 2018 report to Congress, they concluded that the, the data supports well-established research that cites lack of trust as a key barrier and telework support. And um, next up, we're going to be talking about how supervisors and employees can overcome this and other telework challenges and barriers. So I'm going to kick it off, just um, pause for, for a second, and I'm um, just looking at the time check, and just wanted to see, uh, Monica, are there, do you want to give a question or two, and then we'll move on? If not, we can move straight on to the next session. Just want to see Monica or Gabby if you want to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Any other speakers as well if you see questions in the chat? Yeah, okay. we do have a couple of questions in the question section. Yeah. Hi, Kim. It's Gabby from Digital Gov. Um, a couple of questions came through um, direct through the QA box. Um, one was um, was an in-depth in study conducted to identify the economic and environmental benefits? I'm assuming um, that question was for telework. And it was before you provided that smog, the LA smog. Okay, okay. From anecdotally, but I don't know if you have anything to, to add on that. I didn't notice that there was anything as far as a direct study that was done. So I, I think a lot of things are evolving. So I, I haven't seen anything directly on that, but if folks have seen resources, please do feel free to add them to the chat. That'd be great. Awesome. Um, another question from Scott Goldie um, in the Q&A box. There was a three to 8% decrease noted on slide 32. Um, the question is, is that across all agencies or is that broken down by agency? FDA is a user fee environmental and we are more productive according to the congressionally mandated standards that are agreed upon and that, will, that get published every few years. 
That's a great question. So if you actually go back to that slide, so everyone will have the slides themselves. If you go back to that slide, there's a link on the slide to that report. And much of the data and that support that report is broken down by agency size. So I'm not sure about that particular question, but many of them, uh, many of the, the pieces are broken down more specifically to large agencies, smaller agencies. So I would urge you to go in and look at that report directly to get more information. And that's true with all of the, the data that was presented, the links to the reports are, are there. So you're definitely able to dive more deeply. Awesome. Do you want one more question, Kim? Or are you ready? Sure, one more question. Yep. Okay. Um, this one is okay. Um, Celeste Han Cunningham, would you say that um, is asking, would you say that cultural bias has increased or decreased as a result of increased telework? And I'm assuming um, that. It, that question is for, for you as maybe just your experience. Um, so I would actually not really have any data on that and I might leave it up to, uh, to the speakers coming up in the next section to potentially speak to that point. But that's a great question. I actually, our, thank you so much, Gabby, I really appreciate it. Our, our next speaker actually is going to be talking about culture. So I'm going to now, um, go to the, the next slide here. And uh, so this next section is going, it's going to be packed with a wealth of um, great experts that may be presenting on different strategies and tools to achieve success in telework and hybrid environments. And we're gonna start off with culture as being the first thing we're gonna talk about. And Riz Shah from the uh, Department of Energy, uh, the Organizational Culture Advisor at DOE is going to be leading this section. So I'm gonna turn it over to Riz now. Hey, Kim, and everyone else who's dialed in. First of all, I want to appreciate all the work that Kim Wittenberg has done. She has an amazing and canny ability to pull together subject matter experts and thought leaders, and all of you who have also connected. And I'm uh, honored to be a part of this effort, and I really appreciate that. I'm going to start my stopwatch here because I don't want to be that person who talks too much, just to make sure I keep it within your time frame. So we've had a lot of conversations about telework and a lot of the conversation about telework in our agencies in the Department of Energy, as well as some of the other agencies that I partner with, it really comes down to trust. And, it, and it's important that, you know, Kim pointed out the fact that that is one of the major concerns. So I figured we'd take some time to um, address what is it about trust, right? So let's define trust right from the get-go as the belief that someone or something, you or me, we're reliable, we're good, we're honest, we're effective at our jobs, and that we will do the right thing when we are not being observed. And what trust helps to do within your organization is to build a culture of honesty, psychological safety, which I'll talk about next, and mutual respect. It will uh, enhance your ability to exercise influence. But at the end of the day, the way you build that trust is really, um, through open communications. And I think one of these major concerns when it comes around telework, that's the way we get beyond that. So how do we have a conversation in our organization around trust if that's the big problem? So one example I can use around trust is that um, asking a leader, a manager, a supervisor, does anyone in your organization travel? Right. So do they go to a site? Do they go engage in some um, civilian conference? Do they do oversight? Do they go out and provide policy assistance? How do you know that they're working there? You know, I, I hate to, to say this, but a lot of the work we do, it can be repetitive because we are a bureaucracy. So I had a conversation with a senior leader, a dash one in our organization, and I asked a question. When people travel for work, how do you know that they're not just copying and pasting and just changing the date on a report from 10 years ago. And the person had a really bewildered look on their face and why no one would ever do something like that, that would be completely dishonest. I said, so you have complete trust that they're going off to these um, site visits and they're doing exactly what they said they were going to do and then reporting back to you, like, absolutely. So I said, then ask yourself this question and I won't say his name. 
why is it that you will trust them 3,000 miles away, but maybe not 15 miles down the road? So it really comes back to, have we spent the time as managers, leaders, and individuals in building that trust? And so it really, you know, because I know somebody just pointed out that Frank McCovey really speaks about the speed of trust. And without the trust of leadership, the hindrance of all things is always present. Isn't trust the glue that bonds every relationship? So why would it be any different in the workplace? And a lot of the time we talk about communication and building the trust, and it's really two ways. So I, as an employee, how can I build trust with my supervisor? Is to actively keep them notified of different projects, not waiting till deadlines to approach before turning things in and keeping them up to date. Not just, you know, a lot of the times in my professional life, but also what's going on personally, if it can affect um, my mental mood and everything else. So building that trust is really a two-way relationship. And at the end of the day, what ends up doing is it strengthens your employee's commitment and helps build innovation and performance in the workplace. And that is a really important thing to have within your organization is to build that trust. Now, if you click for me there, Kim, the next thing we get into is psychological safety. I, I think is the really next component when it comes to telework and um, being displaced. There was a lot of, how can I say, anecdotal experience when it came to telework before the pandemic happened, right? BC before COVID. And, you know, BC 2020 is the date I like to use. And that anecdotal mean personal experience where either people knew of one employee that may have abused a telework or fear of change. You know, I don't know if I want to allow my workforce to telework because I don't know what that will look like. And fear of change is only overcome through education and experience. So how do we build that psychological safety also for the supervisor? Well, here comes COVID and COVID says, I don't, care what you think about telework, but here we go. So now we're at 59% of the federal workforce has uh, been teleworking. And guess what? Our government is still functioning. Transition of a president and we're still functioning. And I tell you this, the functioning and the high performance of our government is built on the backs of the federal workforce. And that's also important to note. So the psychological safety is really, it's a shared belief by members of a team that we are safe from interpersonal, interpersonal risk, and that we won't be exposed to any interpersonal social threats to ourselves, our identity, our status, or standing in the government, or within our organizations, that it's okay to seek feedback, that if you admit to an error or a lack of knowledge, that you will be chastised for it. And that happens peer to peer, and also happens from supervisor to subordinate, is building that psychological safety. And I'll give you an example of why telework that it comes back to communication is even being more important. For those of you out there with kids, or let's say a family member is supposed to be at home, say by 10 p.m., and they're not there for a time, 10 p.m. The way we are wired as humans, we immediately start to think of all the horrible things that have happened. The person's broken curfew, there's been a car accident. How many people think when someone's running late that perhaps they stopped on the side of the road to help a homeless person? or that they had an opportunity to rescue a kitten or an animal in the road, right? So we're wired in the absence of knowledge to go into a protective mode. So how do you build that psychological safety, trust, and trust through communications? And that's really important. Now we could run down um, every single one of these items on here, and I do have something on here. So if somebody wants to comment, I am trying to monitor um, in the chats as well as we go along. Right, so, and people are having to think through some of that stuff and that's really important. But if you look at the rest of the things on this list, you know, we talk about reliability, there's currently an executive order out for um, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility. Um, communication, we already talked about that. Continuous learning is just as important, both as an individual and as an organization, as you approach the telework, and we think about going back to normal, but I challenge you with this and, and just reflect on this. We're not going to go back to a normal, but we have an opportunity to create a new normal, right? So it's either you can create the culture of what your organization is going to look like in a telework environment, or you can let the environment control you. 
So think of that way when it comes to a continuous learning perspective of this way. Do you want to be a victim of your environment or do you want to be resilient and adapt to what's going on? We've already touched on innovation, collaboration, and connection and engagement. And the transparency is part of that trust model. But you really ask yourself, what is it in the mindset of the manager? And we talked about that, right? Is, is that fear of change and what it looks like. But you also have to approach what is the mindset of the employee? Now we've had telework. We've seen the benefits of telework. That anecdotal evidence is gone or it's expanded, right? You have an idea of how telework has worked for your organization. What are the techniques you've had to use to overcome and adapt? And that's really important. And how has your workforce employee engagement increased in that way? So, and at the end of the day with that mindset of the employee is really turning into wellness and perfectly click side there. And you know, how are we defining wellness as we talk about that subject? Is really anything in the workplace that promotes health and activity, and your organizational policies that are designed to support a healthy behavior amongst your employees and the, improve, uh, the ability to improve your health outcomes. So underneath one of those is something that's near and dear to me and that is work and life balance. And I'm gonna start that off with this conversation or, or this statement. When folks ask me, I'm having challenges with my work-life balance, I always come back with perhaps you're not just having a challenge with your work-life balance is you're questioning what is your life's work, right? And whether it's in the workplace or it's at home. So for me, when I have a challenge in work-life balance, what I'm talking about is my work, you know, where I exchange my certain set of hours for salary my life, which is my family, friends, vacations, everything else I like to do. And then also additional things, I like to do a lot of volunteer work in the veterans community, having been a veteran. So we touch on a few uh, strategies for leadership when it comes to work-life balance. And I'm gonna highlight number three, the third bullet, lead by example, right? If I sit here and tell you that work-life balance is important and my work-life balance is, is, you know, kaput, I am, show up at five o'clock in the morning and don't leave until 8 p.m. at night. I don't take vacations or sick leave. I'm not setting a good example. So that's really important for our managers as well as our informal leaders to practice as well. Uh, and supervisors providing that support in the work-life balance. Now for strategy for employees, do a virtual commute. And this is a great technique. So for me, before the big you know, BC 2020, I'd get up in the morning at four o'clock, it's important for me to be have health and fitness. I would exercise, have a breakfast, get ready, get on the metro, commute into DC, work, and come back. So to me, there was a that metro ride was the bookends to my work day. And then that kind of went away. So I had to come up with what else to do with three hours of my day. Because that's you talk about getting dressed, getting ready, commuting in, commuting out. And so I had to come up with a virtual commute, something to isolate my work day. Some folks need that structure. Other folks don't need that structure. It can be just as effective. So that's also important to understand how you define the start and the end of your work day. We'll move on here because there's a lot of great speakers that Kim has lined up today and I don't want to take up any of their time. So the conversation around telework is really comes to, we've talked about trust, psychological safety, built around communications, but to the individual as well as the organization, it's really important when it comes to resilience and building resilience. A lot of folks and organizations have already demonstrated that resilience, right? And that's really important. It's how well can an organization handle disruption and variations that fall out the design of the system? That's from a systems engineering perspective. For you and me, you know, it's the ability to recognize, adapt, to handle unanticipated events in our lives. And it really comes to the same thing. So supervisors and leaders can offer sessions on resilience and activity building. But I want to point this out. It's really important to encourage staff to take a real lunch break. You know, it's something so simple, but you got to break up your day. You have to, that comes to your work-life balance and providing sustenance and health, go for a walk. I found myself immediately after BC 2020, working much longer hours. You know, that time I would have spent commuting, now I'm on my computer. I am eating lunch at my desk and I am, you know, I'm almost an empty nester. So I'm eating dinners at my desk because I am going back and forth throughout the whole day. So it was really important to set those boundaries for myself and, and test my resilience. 
So part of that from a supervisor perspective, I will ask supervisors to encourage employees to set work and personal boundaries at home because resilience is capitalizing on what you do well to adapt to the change that is not anticipated. And that's important. And we've talked about work-life balance already, so we'll move on from there. But something I want you to put in your pocket as you go away from the conversations today is telework works. It's really important, right? It works. Um, we've all been through a very trying time as a planet, as a nation, as our agencies, and we've come out on top. So the last thing I will say is, you know, we all, all took an oath to defend the Constitution, and if you guys don't realize it, the oath that a federal employee takes is exactly the same oath that a military officer takes. So we are all in the business of taking care of our nation, and I think we have the right people on board. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you off to Alex, and he's going to talk to you about technology, and is far more brilliant on that. So thanks again for the opportunity, Cam, and you guys keep up the good fight. Thank you, Riz. I'm just going to pause for one second. Thank you so much. I just wanted to actually bring Joellen on for a second. And I just wanted to see, um, Joellen, I know that Small Business Association has been doing a lot of work and resilience, and I just wanted to give you a minute to say some words about, about that, if you can hop on for a sec. Hi, I can. I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yeah, I was really excited when I saw Riz's content because we started uh, down a path about a year and a half ago now with what we simply call mindfulness, a mindfulness series. And it's exactly what Riz has listed here. We do one hour sessions bi-weekly and then a couple of times a week, we have a lunch hour, a lunch hour session. It's a lunch session. That's about uh, 10 to 15 minutes long where we really do direct application, anything from breathing exercises to reflective exercises. Um, we talk about really um, recognizing what folks are dealing with because we um, are a small agency, but we're very much in the limelight right now, which is not necessarily a good thing uh, with regard to processing all of the idle and the PPP loans uh, and the Recovery Act dollars. And our folks are really stressed. And so this, this series um, that we've put in place has really been a godsend for a lot of folks to help them process um, what they're going through and to make sure that they are in fact going through and, and not really getting hung up. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, now we're gonna move on to Alex. Alex Harrington is the operations manager and senior advisor at Customs and Border Protection and Homeland Security. I'm gonna turn it over to Alex. Thank you so much. You got it. Let's do a quick comms check. Uh, so Kim, uh, are yep. you able to You're hear great. me early? You're great, yes. Oh, that is awesome, thank you. So um, I'm gonna pretty much do the same thing. So I have my iPhone. And I'm going to actually turn on my timer because I don't want to go past my allotted time. So I'm even, I'm even going to try to shave off some of my time to leave room for, for, for much smarter folks than I. So I'm going to hit my timer. Uh, so real quick here, I'm not going to jump into the weeds yet on technologies and tools. Uh, I want to actually get to the, uh, I will actually get to the uh, strategies. So Kim, if you can go to the, to slide 60, to the strategies. Awesome. Thank you. So before I jump into this, I just want to say this. I want to just kind of throw a couple of things out there for you to just chew on, so to speak, to ponder. Uh, on the outside of government, I, I'm actually a, 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 a certified career coach. I oversee a nonprofit. I've been working with unemployed since 2009. And one thing that I, when somebody, when when I was doing some one-on-ones, um, when I look at an individual's resume, and I'll see, I mean, I understand that everyone's resume, you know, they're, they're, you know, they, it's a close hold, they're proud of it. And so sometimes it's just hard receiving criticism to your resume. But the one thing that I see a lot as a career coach, uh, and I think it's actually a mistake, is when somebody puts on their resume, I know how to use Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, things like that. And when I tell them as a coach, as a career coach, I say, hey, you forgot one thing. And they'll say, well, what's that? I say, well, you need to add, I know how to use a number two 
pencil. And they look at me funny. And I say, for you telling me you know how to use Word or PowerPoint or Excel, you're telling me pretty much you know how to use a pencil because that type of software, that type of organic office uh, uh, resources that we have, it's been around, Microsoft, it's been around for more than 25 years. We're expected to know how to use those software pieces or those apps, so to speak, now it's called nowadays, as, as we know how to use a pencil or how we brush our teeth. It's expected. There's nothing special knowing how to use Microsoft Word or PowerPoint. Now, some folks get a little upset with me, but again, when it comes to technology today, to be able to say that you know how to maybe leverage SharePoint or actually leverage smart sheets or be able to collaborate across an enterprise by using a, a centralized web-based system, that's something that gets me excited. So number one, remember, when it comes to the, some software out there today, we're expected to use. Number two, before I get to the slide, always know that technologies, apps, programs, they're in a constant perpetual beta stage. They're always changing. They're always evolving. I just downloaded Windows 11. Uh, I'm so used to Windows 10 and all that. Now I'm learning how to use Windows 11. It's always changing. Always know that. I don't think it's possible to keep up with the latest uh, uh, technology changes because they're always evolving. So always know that if you, if you master an app today, you might have to relearn it a year from now, just, just to let you know. Also keep in mind, the way we use technology, most of us as end users, not IT specialists, not, not the experts in, this, in that area, not the developers, but the way we use technology as an end user, we tend to use it as a chainsaw on butter. What I mean is we don't truly leverage all the capabilities of technology because most of us as end users, we just don't have time to learn the ins and outs of how to use technology. Thank God for Google because I use Google a lot to learn. And keep in mind last, when it comes to using technology, Know that our attitude and our mindset influences how we use technology. And I'll give you an example. When I came back to the States after three countries in five years, my first five years in government, I went to the Pentagon and I was told, you're going to help build the Army's online social media division. And I said to this SES, I cannot. And she says back to me, you will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so what I did was, uh, I was frustrated in the beginning, but then I put, picked up this book, Who Moved My Cheese, changed my attitude, and dedicated, basically made the commitment, I'm going to dive into it and learn as much as I can. This was in 2008, and that's when I first built my first SharePoint site on IntelLink.gov. I'm an end user. I'm not a techie. My wife may argue against that but I tried to stay ahead of the way, especially with the new recent grads coming in. I want to know at least as just as much as they do or even more. So with all that out, you know, with my personal experiences, there's certain strategies you can actually think of when it comes to the agency, when it comes to the supervisor, and when it comes to the employees. Agencies, and you can see the slide, but I'm just gonna to touch on this. They're responsible for providing the IT resources and the policy, making sure that the end users like you and I have the required resources to leverage the, the to be able to produce and collaborate and, and present effectively when it comes to this remote work. Supervisors, I think the one thing I'll say on supervisors is number one is that leverage the technology to enhance collaboration and information sharing. For example, when it comes to meetings, even if you're on site, if you have people who are remote, meet online so everyone is on the same page, no pun intended. And when leading a meeting, make sure you're using your face-to-face -face webcam. Make sure you leverage all technologies. We're, at, we're past the point now when somebody says, I'm sorry, I just don't look good today. Employees, number one, be familiar with all the tools out there. There's a, there's a, page, there's a slide after this that, re, that presents a list of them. Just know there's so many out there and it's always new tools, new all, things like that. Just have a good understanding how to use all of them if you can. And also practice good time management. 
I knew it with me. My first time I was starting to tell work, I did try the pajamas, didn't work for me, couldn't do it. I still get up at 6 a.m. or even early. I still get ready for work. I, 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 I shave, I drink my coffee, and I have a schedule, and it helps me be engaged all the time. And also when it comes to when it comes to the work boundaries, the one thing about telework for a lot of people who are producers, the gray boundaries, the boundaries between personal and work life, they've grayed and they lost track of time and they're putting more work in each day and they're also experiencing more burnout. You can go to the next slide. Technology and tools just know this. You have the basic equipment that were, that were issued such as a device, a laptop. You have nice to have equipment. For example, buying a special light so people can see you, buying an expensive microphone so people can hear you. But when it comes to technology, just know this. Going back to that story about you put, you put Microsoft Word on, the, on your resume, just know today, nowadays in the information age, I would argue, that we need to have a good understanding, a good, uh, I would say, hands-on approach when it comes to using all types of technologies from messengers to video conference. We're past the point when somebody says, I just don't know, because I actually would respectfully disagree with that because we have Google. So just know when it comes to the strategies and technology, there's so much out there. And I'll be actually throwing Kim a, a link to on, on strategies, but just know this, when it comes to this remote work, I think the last thing I would say is this, just be engaged, always learn new tools and work as though you're on site. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. And I think that leads very nicely, is leading from technology to technology that is accessible um, for all employees. And we're going to turn it over now to Andrew Nielsen, who's a director of government-wide IT at the Accessibility Program and the Office of Government-wide Policy at GSA. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I, I see that you're joining here. Yeah. He's going to be presenting information. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Kim. I'm uh, really happy to be here and to be with all of you today. Uh, just a, a little bit more uh, d description of myself for those that can't see me, uh, and, and this is Andrew speaking, and, and for those that can't see me, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged man uh, it, with a reddish beard and brown hair, and, and I probably obviously think way too much of myself. My background, uh, my virtual background today has this ray of light shining, shining down above me with my, with my uh, GSA logo in the corner. Uh, but because I'm preaching the good word of, of accessibility, uh, perhaps it's okay to, to let you think that I'm some messenger from above. Um, but but when, <laughs> when it comes to accessibility, we have a law um, in, uh, in the US uh, that requires that federal agencies uh, provide equal access to information and use of information and information technology uh, for people with disabilities that is equivalent to the use of, of, of uh, for people without disabilities. And, and that law is, is codified in, in Section 5, or the, the law, the legislation was Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe a little bit more intro introduction for my organization. Uh, my, my organization is the organization that also in that law, along with the U.S. Access Board, uh, was tasked or given the mandate to provide technical assistance to agencies um, with all things related to complying with this law, uh, Section 508. Uh, the U.S. Access Board defined the regulations and, and, and GSA uh, takes a, on a little bit more of the role of, of providing uh, some of the best practices and guidance. And you can find a lot of that uh, in, in, at the website that we manage called section508.gov um, with a lot of great information there, uh, the tips on, uh, on just how to make a, a web uh, or a web page or a document or presentation accessible, how to run accessible meetings. And, and by the way, uh, Kim and, and the, the Digital Gov uh, team are doing a great job of, of running an accessible meeting. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and also tips on, on how to run uh, for, for Section 508 program managers, how to run effective programs. Uh, so go to section508.gov as, uh, as a great starting point on, on, uh, on additional information about how you can, you can make uh, your content accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, as Kim mentioned earlier, uh, this new telework environment really can level the playing field in, in a lot of ways for a lot of people with disabilities, uh, just in terms of, of uh, getting to work and navigating uh, while even at work in, in buildings that 
while we have um, uh, requirements for physical access uh, sometimes can, can still just be frustrating and, and difficult to, to navigate around um, or just more time consuming uh, for, for people with certain types of disabilities. Um, but, it, but our telework environment really can only level the playing field as long as we choose to use technologies and use them in, the, in a way that is accessible to people with disabilities. We, we need to be careful not to create new barriers or new challenges for people with disabilities. Um, but but it, if we do, if we choose the right technologies and we choose to use them in the right way, um, it, it it really can help us uh, again level that playing field and and uh, and and make uh, um, just make life easier for people with disabilities. Um, so it really can help us remove some of those barriers. Um, one thing uh, important point I want to make, uh, and and I, and I suppose I include this this note because. In, in what I do, in the, in the work that I do, I, I'm often kind of seen as a party crasher because we find out that an application or a web page or, or even a document is not accessible and, and, and somebody like me comes in and says, and, you know, we put on the brakes and say, whoa, uh, you can't publish this unless it's accessible. And so we're kind of seen as the party crashers. Um, but but what, I, what I hope to convey is that, that accessibility is not something, uh, you know, that happens to you when somebody comes in and says, well, pause, we need, to, we need to make this accessible. But really, we need to enlist um, everyone in, in the federal workspace to, to make our content more accessible um, and to make our tools and our, and our technologies more accessible. So accessibility really happens because of you. And it really can come down to some very small changes in the, in the way that we, we operate on a daily basis. Um, uh, one, really simple, uh, one really simple practice you can implement is, is simply make it a, a habit to use, if you're using the Microsoft Office uh, suite of products in Microsoft Word or Microsoft PowerPoint, simply use the accessibility checker on the review tab in, in Microsoft Word or in Microsoft PowerPoint. Start there and, and that will actually walk you through, here, here are uh, potential issues you might have and give you advice on how to fix that for somebody with a disability. And, and, I'll, and I'll pause there and, and mention that well, depending on, on who you ask and how you measure, uh, but there are as many as one in five or even one in four Americans that have some type of a disability. And, and as we progress in life, there's a high likelihood that we will ac acquire a disability, even if you don't have one at the moment. Um, and not all disabilities are, are readily evident. Uh, they're not obvious. Um, so you, it's the, I'm saying, mentioning that just simply to, to highlight the fact that it, there's a very high likelihood that someone you work with has a disability, even if you don't know it. Um, and there's a high likelihood that someone you work with or you might acquire a disability. So it's really important to just basically just assume that, that you're working with people with disabilities. And, and even if you don't know it, it it's up to you to, to make life easier for your colleagues and coworkers. Um, and, and, and again, you know, using, using the accessibility checker um, in Microsoft Word is a great way to start. Also, uh, you know, now that we're in this telework environment and we're having meetings so much more often virtually, uh, make it a habit to ask if people need an accommodation, if they need, if they need help uh, making sure that they have access to certain information, change, the pra change practices in how we conduct meetings. Um, people who use sign language interpreters often are marginalized in meetings because there's always a little bit of a day, delay in the translation and it's hard to, to cut in and, and to offer input. So we need to be more deliberate, deliberate, not just in our meetings, but in all of the ways that we interact with, with people on our teams uh, so that we, we can make sure that we really are inclusive and that we solicit input rather than just waiting for someone to speak up. So, so again, accessibility happens because of you. Um, and, and, and it's not something that's happening to you, but it's, it's really something that we can all and, and all should be engaged in. So, so another thing, uh, it's maybe more than just a small change, um, but, uh, but another way for us to address accessibility is by, by thinking of it earlier um, in, our, in development of our, uh, of, of our work products. Um, the, and, and, and it's not just for applications and, and development of big systems, but even as I'm thinking about creating a document, for instance, or a report, whether I post it to the internet uh, for all for public to, to see, or if it's some internal document for, for internal consumption, um, it, think about accessibility early on. If you don't know whether or not you have the tools that you, you need to use uh, or, or, or can use to make it accessible, um, find out what, what you need. And again, uh, go to section5way.gov for some great, uh, as, at least as a starting point. 
and, uh, and, and there's some great resources there. I'm gonna leave it at that uh, in, in the interest of time and, and to give more time uh, to, to following speakers. Um, but again, section508.gov, or you can reach out to us at section.508 at gsa.gov, or to, to your agency's Section 508 program managers, and that listing is also available on, on section508.gov. Kim, thanks so much for the time, and thank you, everyone, for your, your attention. Thank you so much, Andrew, for, for presenting that today. And I just wanted to point everyone also um, to the slides and, and see the appendix where there's a wealth of information about accessibility as well. So thank you so much. And I want to advance the slides here. And next up, we're going to talk about reasonable accommodation during telework. And Alexander Cowdery is going to be presenting. He is a GSA program manager in the Center for Information Technology Access. And I just want to let folks know that we are currently on slide 67. I'm going to turn it over to Alex, letting him pull up his, unmute himself and. Hello. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm gonna to be defining, uh, well, first of all, I'm wearing a button down shirt today, which is as fancy as it gets nowadays. And I love that, yay telecommuting. Uh, in my photo, I had a, a suit on, full disclosure. My beard is a lot grayer now than the photo, which is about five years old. Um, today I'm gonna to be defining reasonable accommodations, discussing strategies for reviewing requests, and then looking at three different kinds of accommodations, as well as some reasonable accommodation best practices. Um, a reasonable accommodation is defined as any change to the application or hiring process, to the job, to the way the job is done, or to the work environment that allows a person with a disability who's qualified for the job to perform the essential functions of that job and enjoy equal employment opportunities. And accommodations are considered reasonable if they do not create undue hardship or a direct threat. Um, at slide 68, this is the strategies. Uh, next slide, please. thanks. Um, strategies or methods for evaluating requests and approving and funding accommodations uh, need to be several things. They need to be fair. They need to be communicated clearly. Uh, this should be part of an agency reasonable accommodation policy. Uh, they need to be respectful and they need to be focused on helping employees perform their work. Uh, that is what they need to get their job done. Uh, next slide, 69, please. There are three large categories of accommodations. Um, the first one is assistive technology um, to help uh, employees use accessible information technology, for example, screen enlargement or voice recognition software. Uh, or a large screen monitor or a trackball uh, that might be used instead of a regular computer mouse. Uh, furniture and workplace accommodations are another category like task lighting, uh, noise canceling headphones for persons who have uh, attention deficit uh, or special ergonomic chairs, for example, a chair with a tailbone cutout in the seat foam uh, or an extra heavy duty chair. That's another category of uh, reasonable accommodations. And finally, uh, another category is services like interpreters for persons with hearing impairments or who are deaf with a capital D, uh, readers for persons with visual impairments or who are blind and personal assistance services that help with uh, activities of daily living, uh, like for example, eating or, or moving uh, from place to place. There are other types of accommodations as well. Uh, and these include, uh, but aren't limited to change in working hours, or working conditions or changing non-essential job tasks. So the, the number one, I guess, best practice for agencies is to centrally fund uh, as many of those three categories, because those are the ones mostly where you have to buy things uh, as they can. Uh, and a second best approach would be to centrally fund accommodations by sub agencies. Uh, so if you, if you have different bureaus, for example, you could have one accommodation fund for the whole bureau. Some of the benefits for centralized funding including include supporting agency diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility efforts. Uh, and this has been a very hot topic lately, and this is one of the best ways that you can um, move your agency along doing that. Removing uh, barriers to hiring persons with disabilities is another benefit uh, because you're taking the cost and effort of accommodation away from the local 
uh, hiring offices where they could potentially influence hiring decisions if people have to budget for the accommodations as well as the cost of hiring individuals. It can allow the quicker accommodation to individuals with disabilities, as well as the economies of scale that you get when you buy um, like 10 versions of uh, 10 copies of a piece of software instead of buying them one at a time. Uh, you also could get some efficiencies in your procurement efforts uh, because, you know, one purchase, uh, a purchase of 10 software doesn't take any more time than purchasing one uh, copy of the software. You can facilitate the required tracking of government property, uh, particularly in uh, government property that's going to home offices as reasonable accommodations. If it's centrally funded, then you have one point where it's all being purchased to make sure that you capture it. You can increase agency reporting to EEOC on a number of persons with disabilities and accommodations provided. This is required, um, you know, that every agency is already doing this, but when you have it centralized, it's a lot easier to keep track and make sure that you capture every one. Uh, and last but not least, you can help agencies to become uh, a model agency and a reasonable accommodation of persons with disabilities. The next slide, which is 71, is about reasonable accommodation of equipment. Um, a federal register notice in March 2006 stated agencies may provide slash procure either new or excess equipment for alternative work sites as long as it's clear that the equipment continues to belong to the government and there's an audit trail indicating the location of the equipment. Uh, note that this doesn't just apply to reasonable accommodation but to all teleworkers, but it sets the stage that agencies can uh, provide equipment for people in their house. Even if for some reason it wasn't, uh, you can make an exception to any policy for reasonable accommodations anyway. Uh, the next slide is 72. I'm gonna start talking about some other best practices. Uh, and like the curb cuts that are in sidewalks, most of these best practices would benefit many employees that don't have disabilities as well. Um, the first one is the remote installation of software. Uh, this is key for employees who telework particularly full time. Uh, many agencies have improved their remote support capabilities during the pandemic. Uh, this has been fantastic for folks with disabilities. Purchasing assistive talk, uh, technology software licenses where the software can be downloaded instead of having to uh, rely on getting disks can allow for much more flexibility in installation uh, as well as it being the quickest option. Um, you can by as soon as you purchase software, a lot of times you will get an email with a download uh, code or a serial number, allowing it to be installed so much quicker. Um, and of course, you have to make sure that you capture the information for the AT software so that it can be managed, which takes us to slide 73. So CIOs are already required by OMB to manage software, uh, and that includes AT software. Many types of uh, AT software have gone to an annual release model, uh, like, you know, for example, blah, blah, 2021. Uh, the, if you buy a software maintenance agreement, you can make sure that employees can always get the latest version. Uh, and there's also some economies of scale, whereas, you know, it's less than buying a new copy of the software each year or even the upgrade prices. Uh, and most importantly, the time that's involved in the procurement cycle is safe when you're buying multiple years at once. And centrally managing the software licenses as required allows the best practice of using your, um, reusing your software when people leave uh, the agency. Slide 74 is about reasonable accommodations and device shipping. Uh, shipping of computers like laptops, hardware like keyboards, mice and stuff, uh, monitors, allows the devices to be distributed uh, to home offices without requiring employees to report to an office location. That's convenient for a lot of employees, but it's critical for some persons with disabilities. Uh, best practice is to keep an inventory of empty boxes that can be sent to home offices so that you have one. Uh, if something needs to be returned or repaired, you can send the employee an empty box. Uh, if they're able to ship it and send it back in, that makes things a lot easier. The next generation delivery service, which all agencies are required to use, uh, has home pickup fees uh, for UPS and he uh, FedEx that are usually about less than $10. And shipping a laptop is usually less than $30. So that's 
far more economical than the cost of employees' time in most cases to go uh, to the office and, and back, unless they you know happen to live next door. Um, slide 75. Uh, reasonable accommodation services and furniture delivery. This is some of the, um, this is a lot of the more work intensive kinds of accommodations to provide uh, because you have to do it on a case by case basis. Uh, most of the time that you'll need local contractors to do this work. Uh, for example, to uh, install a piece of furniture or, uh, you know, because it'll have to be uh, the, the different things involved are the delivery, the assembly, installation, uh, the package removal. You also have to worry about the inventory, the replacement, and eventual return uh, to the agency. Uh, the total cost of all those considerations should be included when agency is deciding if a given accommodation is reasonable. And uh, my last slide is slide 76. I wanted to share two great resources, OPM's reasonable accommodation page, which has a rather long URL, uh, but if you use a popular search engine and type into it OPM reasonable accommodation, it'll take you right to that page as the first link. And the second resource I wanted to share is from the Department of Labor Disability Employment Policy, and it's for their job accommodation network. If you go to that same search engine, you can find that as the first hit if you put in the DOL space J-A-N. Uh, Thank you for your time today, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the seminar. Thank you so much, Alex. That was really helpful. And I, I do see some uh, questions in the chat and we will get to those questions as the seminar goes through and we'll also um, address the ones that we haven't had time to address after the seminar as well. But I just wanna continue on and uh, move on to telework policy and telework agreements. And this section is going to be presented by Lauren uh, Giacoloni, who is the performance management consultant from OPM. So welcome, Lauren. And if you could turn on your, your mic. Yep, I'm up. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank okay. you. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much. I've heard such great information today. So this is such an excellent webinar that we all get to be a part of. As Kim mentioned, I'm Lauren Giacoloni. I work with OPM, but I just wanna preface that I do not work in policy. I work on the non-appropriated side of the house in an organization called Human Resources Solutions. So what our organization does is we help the federal government come in and provide cradle to grave HR solutions from classification to staffing to performance management which is what my subject matter expertise is in. And, you know, workforce succession planning, all of that stuff. On paper, we look more like federal contractors, but we actually are GS federal employees. So we're by government for government. And a lot of my section is going to be best practice related, right? So every agency, not every agency, most of the agencies have a, a standardized, you know, developed performance program and policy. So a lot of things that I'm going to touch upon today, <laughs> you're going to hear me say, well, depends on your policy, depends on your policy, depends on your policy. And that's how just it goes because every policy is different, especially when it comes to performance. So we'll start with telework. We want to make sure that if you have a telework policy, meaning your agency is approved to offer telework agreements, that you're familiar with that policy because it explains things such as what performance standards need to be maintained? What does my score need to be or my rating need to be to ensure that I'm allowed to telework outside of these emergency situations, right? We have to agree on what the, agree the agreement's gonna say between the supervisor and the employee of our schedule. When our core work hours are, is there flexibility there in our work hours? What is that flexibility going to look like? Do I need to just let my supervisor know or as a supervisor, do you want your employees just to let you know that they're gonna change their telework day and come into the office? Or is it just a, a request situation because maybe there's something going on such as hoteling of desks, which I know is becoming very popular where that schedule has to be more rigid and has to be figured out with, through communication. So there's no disconnect in expectations and no contention happening there because you know people just aren't familiar with the agreement. So as supervisors, first step, read that agreement if you haven't done it yet, if you have one, and make sure you're on the same page, A, as that policy, and B, then is your employee based on what's put into that policy of what's expected. You can go to the next slide. 
And then employees, you know, there's actually accountability in both ways in performance management, which is sometimes, you know, culturally misconstrued as the supervisor is really responsible for most of performance management. And that's a false mindset. I want you to know, employees in the room, that you do have a lot of responsibility when it comes to your performance and communicating your performance. And then also any agreements that you come to terms with and sign off on, you also have accountability there. So make sure that if you don't know maybe the flexibility allowed and you have something come up, talk to your supervisor first and say, hey, this is coming up. I want to know, you know what that flexibility is ensuring that you're tracking your time appropriately. There's different codes that you potentially have to use when you're teleworking or remote working from home. How you're gonna handle classified documents. Do you need to be on a, a different server? Is there a, a, a method for opening Excel files, password protected, making sure you're keeping up to speed on what's expected there. Using your government equipment, we all do the IT training, You know, making sure you actually pay attention to that training as much as possible. I know we tend to click through quickly, um, but if you're, especially if you're a teleworker, you need to make sure you're protecting your equipment. Are you leaving your ID card in when you're not home into your, in your computer? Potentially you get robbed and now they have your ID card as well. So making sure you're putting into fruition appropriate protocol for your, you know, your equipment that's not protected as it would be in the office. What you do during emergency closing, dismissals, you know, DC area is different than where I am in Chicago. You know, we don't technically get snow days, right? So because that's really DC metro, how do you handle that? What's the norm? What does your policy say? Your performance standards, we're going to talk a lot about this in a minute, so I'm not going to go too much in depth there, but understanding your own performance, advocating for your own performance, tracking your own performance is so vital all the time, not just when you're teleworking, but especially when you're teleworking, because there is that trust that needs to be built, right? We heard um, Riz say that earlier. We need to be able to earn trust and get trust in return. And if there's any consequences for not adhering to that policy. So workman's comp, if you don't have a, a safe you know, home space and you're trying to file for workman's comp and, we've, and it's found out that you know, it's because you actually weren't having a, a safe home environment, there could be consequences for that according to your policy potentially. Now we're going to get into my bread and butter performance management. So really, why is performance management so important? It is what we as employees and you folks in the room as supervisors use to know that a job well done is occurring. It is that level of excellence we're meant to achieve. Again, we are public servants. We want to be doing a job well done, but we need to have metrics in place that support that. And telework's interesting because people always want telework trainings from us, right? How do I work from home? Well, your work really shouldn't be changing so much. Your work should be the same as it is in the office, as it is at home. You could set up your environment more properly for telework, but your work should stay the same. So what we're going to talk about now is these, you know, metrics, these goals, these standards works for all employees. The first one being we want to, according to your policy, work collaboratively with your employee to develop the employee's performance plan. I do know there's probably a lot of folks in the room who are on standardized plans and that's okay. There's still ways to communicate clear and smart goals. So specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based with your employees, even if there's standardized plans occurring. If you do have the ability according to your you know, program or policy to customize plans, do that. Change it from year to year. You know, we just had a big two years. A lot of folks said, well, I couldn't even, you know, uh, accomplish half of what was on my performance plan because of COVID. And I said, well, COVID happened in March. You had, you know, five months to potentially update your plan with different metrics because most policies, I won't say all, most policies allow for changes up, you know, 120 to 90 days before the end of the rating period. So if there is a change in you know, um, uh, strategy or leadership goals or anything like that, you could go in and change your plans accordingly. And you wanna make sure supervisors and employees that you have measures with your goals, your results that support that. Your goal and result is going to be an outcome or an output stemming from sort of some sort of activity. So an example I'll give is that we see a lot is, uh, you know, visit eight field locations by quarter three, as an example. There is no results or goal within that statement. There's nothing to achieve or to accomplish. Is just visiting a field location, something that I should eight times 
makes me a fully successful employee. What am I supposed to achieve while I'm at these field locations? Is it to ensure that safety protocol is being followed at these locations? That's something that I could go ahead and measure. Is it to ensure that there's going to be appropriate logistics coming out of these locations, depending on the products that I put out there? Or maybe I need to submit three to five recommendations to my supervisor or leadership by the third quarter. I could submit three to five recommendations, but what if they're all full of errors? What if they don't have the content that they should have? What if they need to be reworked several, several times before one is even accepted? So a goal or a result out of that could be submit three to five appropriate recommendations by quarter three with one being accepted. So the acceptance of the, of the recommendations is what we're gonna focus on here. One, being accepted being the measure. So what are the measures? Quantity, quality, the acceptance, that's gonna be quality, right? How well the employee performed, complexity level, innovation, impact of the product, quantity, three to five, at least one accepted. Timeliness, quarter three, we wanna put timeliness factors into our performance that's not just the end of the fiscal year. A few reasons for this is because, A, as humans, we're not robots, right? We tend to procrastinate when we can, especially when we have so many competing priorities happening. So we want to ensure timely work and prioritization of work is happening appropriately with timeliness metrics. And at the end of the year, our plan closes out anyway. Every year we're rated. So that's just inherently already built in that this work is meant to be completed within one fiscal year. We don't need to put it in there twice. And then cost effectiveness. This is one, you know, if you work in finance, you're a project manager, you know, quality control, all of that stuff, amount of savings or cost controls. Example be within 5% of budget. However, I want to preface here that if you're going to use any measure on this page, include quality any way you can. Because again, if you say you want, we want to see a project completed within 5% of budget. You don't say something quality related like without exceeding budget, what could someone then come back and say? I'll wait for the chat just a second. If you don't add a quality measure of within 5% of budget without exceeding budget, someone could come back and say, well, I completed the project. I was only 4% over budget, which is the exact opposite of cost effectiveness, right? We need to put our very strong, you know, lawyer hats on using proper language to keep the accountability strong for our folks. I'll move forward from here. So that being said, I gave a pretty brief, that's a, what you just saw on one slide, I get four hour trainings on. So if you get this full, you know, incorrect, do not feel bad about that. But if which fits the criteria of having a strong result, remember a goal that's measurable, paying attention to that language that I, that I mentioned at this point, is that A, oversee contracting actions, B, guide the preparation and execution of balanced and defensible budgets, C, engage in special projects, or D, manage the customer satisfaction survey. Which one do we think it is that we could take as it is and say, this is how this will look successfully with a measure? Which one do we think? And I can't see how many people are participating in the polls. You could go ahead and close it whenever you feel <laughs> necessary. That looks good. Hi, it's Gabby from Digital Gov. We are still seeing a number of, of responses rolling in um, and it keeps climbing, but I can go ahead and close. There's about 206, uh, yeah, about 265 now, 70. A lot of people are still responding, but yeah, I'll go ahead and end the poll for you. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so it looks like the winner actually did come out ahead. So guide the preparation and execution of balanced and defensible budgets. The reason why this one is accurate and the rest aren't is because overseas contracting actions, I don't know what that means exactly. There's not something for me to achieve here. What about the contracting actions is important? Remember, visit field locations. What am I supposed to do there? If I go and visit the field locations, but I sit in the break room the entire time eating Snickers bars, I'm not gonna be achieving anything impactful for my agency, right? Same here, I don't know what overseas is. I could just read the emails, that's me overseeing it. C, engage in special projects. 
same thing. What does that mean? What am I meant to attain or achieve from those special projects? Same with D. So B, my goal is balanced and defensible. My budgets need to be balanced and defensible. I could go ahead and measure that in some way, depending on you know, what that means for my agency or my supervisor, but that's something that I could go ahead and try to accomplish and achieve clearly. And you can go to the next slide. So when we're done with planning, we've gone through our plans, our standards, they're set, they have rock solid measures, they have strong results and goals to achieve stemming from activities. So they can have activities, just make sure you have results and measures associated with them. We do not want this to go, you know, die on the shelf until the mid-year review. Bring this back around to make sure, again, performance expectations or goals haven't changed. There is a lot of change occurring in the government right now. We went through a pandemic, we went through a new administration. Make sure that these still match up to what your employee is meant to be participating in throughout you know, that fiscal year. If there's progress being made, because you can't deal with a poor performer if you're not tracking performance. Feedback is provided. We want to make sure that we're our employees' GPS according to their map, right? A performance plan is a map to success. Supervisors, you're the GPS in the background. You know, I could download my map on my phone and get in my car and drive, but my map's not going to tell me, you know, this lane is blocked for an accident or uh, construction. The map itself isn't going to tell me that. What tells me that? My GPS, right? It'll say stay in the left lane because there's construction ahead. So you're not going to be able to exit based on that construction. That's you as a supervisor. Employ employees in the room, get you know, request that kind of feedback if you're not getting it. You can only advocate for yourself in your own performance. And that means getting more support if you need it. If there's gonna be strategies for improvement, that's gonna happen from making sure we're having these conversations regularly. And then continual praise for accomplishments because we hear feedback, we hear performance, and culturally, they're kind of scary words, you know? It's like, oh, I wanna talk about your performance in this meeting next week, come with agenda, you know, come with examples. You're kind of like, oh man, it's kind of getting that text, right? Of we need to talk. It kind of freaks people out. But if it happens more regularly, that culture changes. Every maybe month we have a performance discussion with our team or with our folks individually. That's going to help make sure that this happens more organically and inherently in a non-scary way. And then employees, you are still responsible for tracking your performance. Get an Excel file going. Get an Outlook folder going titled accomplishments that you put all of your positive feedback in from customers or colleagues or leadership, whatever it is. I have one, my accomplishments folder. So anytime I give a training or work on a project and I get good feedback, I put that in there because that's where I know at the end of the year, I'm going to go and find all of the great stuff I've done, you know, throughout the year. It's just very easy if you're tracking, you know, a little bit all the time when you're writing your accomplishments follow this, you know, map here, you're going to get these slides. Think about what you did that is impactful. Not what your team did, not what your organization did. What did you do? If you can't brag about yourself in your own performance appraisal, where can you? There's literally no other appropriate place to do this. This is when you need to not be humble, be accurate, be actual, be fair, but Make sure you have a robust argument for why you believe you deserve the rating you do based on what you did throughout the year. And then at that point, hopefully your supervisor will have a much easier job to do the actual rating, right? Because those measurable objectives are done. You wrote your accomplishment narratives to those objectives. If you needed to achieve a 4.8 customer satisfaction score and you got a 4.85, and here's all of the, you know, data you've been tracking on that, give it to them, done. It's really takes away contention, takes away subjectivity, and allows the supervisor to hold their employees, teleworkers and non-teleworkers like, because again, we're on the same performance standards as the work doesn't change, allows you to assess your performance based on those results achieved expectations. There's no collaboration needing to be done because it's already been done from the beginning. So you know what your map to success is from the start, your, your supervisors, you know what your employees map to success is. Hopefully all of that communication and feedback makes rating a breeze. If rating is difficult for you at this point in time, you might wanna rethink the techniques that you're using 
throughout the year to make this easier. So don't add extra requirements to teleworkers, requiring them to document their work when working at home. That's that teletrust that needs to be culturally appropriate within your organization because that is the world that we live in now. I love Rose's example about the travel. That's 100% true. And then it allows us to address performance issues. It's harder to have difficult conversations, typically, I'm not gonna say for everybody, but typically you know, over the phone or through uh, virtual means. However, we cannot wait to address scheduled discussions to address performance issues. It has to be something that is done appropriately, you nip it in the bud because there's so much data and so much research that shows not addressing performance issues timely and accurately causes a you know, waterfall of effect for your team, for your organization, for you, you your trust in your uh, relationships with your other subordinates all together. So meet in person or over video. You want to see body language. You want to ensure if there's some sort of hot topic, you know, hot buttons occurring that from language that you're using, those are, you know, the telltale signs of contentious conversations. Discuss concerns honestly and openly. Don't come in with assumptions. Don't come in with blame. Say, I've gotten six customer complaints in the last four weeks. Can you tell me what's going on with that? Ask a question right out the gate, first 30 seconds, to make sure an employee knows that they have a seat at the table to be able to participate in a discussion like this. Because performance issues is going to be difficult all around. It's not a fun part of your job. I, uh, you know, I want sugarcoat that. But then you want to also come up with goals together, so an action plan. It's very unlikely one conversation is going to fix a real performance issue, but you could come up with short-term goals to help get you there. And then acknowledge improvement and successes. So don't let up just because you see some improvement, you know, one meeting, two meetings, keep this going. Your, your, your more, you know, lower performing employees, they might need to meet with you weekly. Your, you know, average performing employees, they might need to work with you bi-weekly or, or whatnot. And your, your high performing folks get more autonomy, maybe they're monthly. Keep up a schedule that works for you as a supervisor to stay on top of performance where it matters. And then we get into establishing and setting norms. So now we're getting more into the performance, best practices, how to set up your environment for telework. We want to make sure we're promoting a healthy culture. I've heard it a few times in the session today already. Lead by example, establish those norms. So if we're gonna do things like setting a, a, a set lunch break, if we need to do that because we're having a lot of struggle, then we need to do that, right? If we need to, you know, maybe start a mile club where everyone gets out and walks a little bit every day and it's kind of like a competition and the winner gets, you know, you could come up with creative ways to set, set a healthy culture, whatever works for your team at the end of the day. But the most important thing is establishing norms for yourself and your employees is telework to encourage good performance and conduct when teleworking because if we're getting burned out, we're getting agitated with difficult, uh, you know, the ability to not be able to communicate easily, et cetera, et cetera, that's going to cause a lot of issues as we've already discussed earlier. So we go ahead and move forward. We need to set individual norms for ourselves and accept the individual norms that our employees want to set as well. So what can we do? There's a lot of examples on this page. I'm not gonna read every single one, but we wanna be responsive and accountable. What's our plan for that? Are there core work hours where we need to be able to respond via Skype or Link or Teams or whatever platform we're using? Adhere to performance plan. So continuing to do our work properly from home, because that is the whole point, right? Tracking our projects, recording our goal achievement. Feel comfortable with more autonomy because that's just inherently what we're gonna have when we're working at home. So we're not gonna be able to walk next door and ask a question like that. We're not gonna be able to do you know, certain things that we're used to doing. We need to be feel comfortable in our jobs. And if we don't, if we don't feel like that, you know, outside of the pandemic situation, maybe we telework less until we feel more developed in our role and are comfortable working from home. Keep our calendar up to date. Calendaring is huge. You know, we don't want to start that back and forth of, oh, why did they put a meeting on my calendar? The person's putting a meeting on your calendar because it's not blocked off. They didn't know you had a dentist appointment at 2.30, right? So we wanna make sure we're keeping our calendar up to date to avoid any contention happening with ourselves or our team or our colleagues and continuous improvement and learning. That's going to be something that we're always doing. The IDP, you know, the individual development plan, who signs their IDP once a year, goes and dies on a shelf somewhere. We never really see it again until you re-sign it the following year. 
as a supervisor, if you bring that out twice a year, you're going to be a you know rock star to your folks like, oh, they really do care about my development just by bringing out that document that's kind of, you know, the, the I don't want to say the joke of the federal documents, but the one that we tend to disregard the most because it's not applicable all the time. It's not you know policy driven. It's just a nice thing to look forward to. Bring that baby out. It'll show so much investment in your folks, you know, even if it's quarterly, track the development there. Maintain a suitable workplace. We've heard a lot about that. So making sure it's safe, making sure that it's healthy, all of those things. Work-life balance. Keep your computer in one spot. Don't bring it to the couch after dinner. If you don't, you know, if you close it at five o'clock, close at five o'clock. You'll look at it again at 7.30 or eight or nine the next morning, whatever it is. Set those boundaries for you. And supervisors follow the same. If your folks see you on at nine o'clock at night, they're gonna think maybe that's expected of them as well. And we can move on. And then setting team norms. This is huge when we get into hybrid work. So telework is working from home, right? And the telework construct is more focusing on the individual. But we're as a federal government going into more of this hybrid construct where we're all going to be teleworking, remote working, some people in the office, some people at home, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of need to change the you know, team ideals that we're dealing with here. Team charters. If you don't know what a team charter is, Google it. It's how you can develop communication plans. If you have folks on the East Coast and the West Coast, are you going to maybe make a, a, a contract that you're not going to have any team meetings before maybe 10 a.m. Central? So it's 8 a.m. West Coast time, noon East Coast time. So ensure we're not expecting West Coast folks to like sign in at 6 a.m. because we're not being conscientious of, of you know, the difference in time zones. How we're going to document share methods of reaching consensus. This can all be documented in a team charter. That is an unofficial contract. Yeah, we sign it. It's not, you know, if you don't, you break the charter, you're not getting in trouble in any, any way. But what it does is it closes our communication gap. It closes our expectation gap so that we all are on the same page as a team and we understand what's expected of us. As humans, we really like that. We like to know our boundaries. We like to know the rules. We like to know, you know, the culture that we're working within, a team charter is a great way to do that. And also it gets conversation going because as supervisors, this is a great exercise to give your team to run with. What do they want their out of offices to say? As long as it's something, you know, well, how do they like to celebrate? How do they like to be recognized? What is rewarding to them as a team? This is all stuff that you could find out by saying, hey, I wanna set up a team charter. These are the buckets that I want filled. Who wants to be on the committee to do this, to have these conversations and, and get this ball rolling? So making sure that you are setting these team norms to take away any contention, any issues that could arise from not being face-to-face -face all the time. And then ultimately the whole goal of having strong performance standards, having strong norms is enhancing engagement and connection because then it allows folks to know how to do this. So how do we define employee engagement? OPM actually defines it as an employee sense of purpose that is evident in their display of dedication, persistence, and effort in their work and overall attachment to their organization and its mission. That makes sense, right? That is what engagement means typically in, in any workplace. However, we wanna make sure we're following the proper strategies for that from the supervisors and employees. Yes, you have a role here to play as well, the next slide, but we need to engage, engage, engage. How often do we meet with our folks? How often do we meet one-on-one -on -one with our folks? That's, a, that's the you know, age-old question. How much is too much? How little is too little? We wanna meet with our folks one-on-one, -on -one, best practice, minimally for 15 minutes bi-weekly. And that's our folks that are fully successful, you know, have a strong work ethic, get the job done, et cetera. But having that 15 minutes on their calendar for you every bi-weekly bi allows them to have a sense of security and safety and to not feel isolated, to feel like they're gonna be listened to, that they have a, a, a space and a platform to have conversations. If there's any questions coming up with telework or they're having any issues with a customer or a colleague, that is their time to talk about it with you. That psychological safety is then created. You know, it's inclusive. You show value and respect and, and listening to your folks. So just get it on the calendar, 15 minutes. I know a lot of people sometimes manage larger groups, do what's best for you, 
But if you can, that is best practice. If you have a, a, you know, a smaller team, maybe 30 minutes every two weeks or 30 minutes once a month to break it up a little. If you have folks that are really high performers and they don't feel necessary to meet with you that much, maybe that's a way to reward them saying, all right, I'm gonna make you meet with me for 15 minutes a month because you're such an outstanding employee. So we can't always get rewards and money and, and stuff like that and bonuses and time off. That's just another little way to promote that. For the sake of time, we can move on. I only have a minute left, go ahead. Um, and then employees, your role here is to create your goals, increase organizational awareness, increase organizational commitment, focus on organizational effectiveness. You are not just a cog in the machine. You have task identity, you have task significance. Your plans should be aligned with strategic goals and leadership goals and all of these things so that you understand the impact you're making with your mission, with your vision, and you know the impact you're having in the federal government in, as a whole. So, you know, sussing out what your task identity is, what your, what your task significance is through feedback is how you're going to support your own engagement because maybe you didn't know something that you're working on is actually a bigger picture and that's really cool to you. But if you don't ask, you won't know, right? You need to make sure that you are communicate and, and engage it's not just your supervisor's responsibility. This is your work. This is how you're spending your time. Find engagement where you can, because at the end of the day, it's going to make yourself, yourself a lot happier and your team a lot happier. Use these virtual tools. We heard a lot about virtual tools today. Get on video, 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 video. If you're on a, a if you call a colleague for a question, get on video because your relationships will enhance that way. And what do you need to do as an individual? Rest, recover, don't work all hours of the night or early, early into the morning. Take your, you know, your health and your well-being very seriously. And for supervisors connecting, do not rely on written communications, video, 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 especially in a telework or remote scenario. Sorry, I set myself a 30 minute, minute. I have five minutes left, so it's okay. Um, make an effort to learn, ask your employees, you know, what makes you jump out of bed in the morning? What makes you wanna hit your alarm as I just did for my phone? What, those are those roadblocks that your employees are going to say, oh, they're actually interested in what needs to change, you know, from my perspective. You could even ask your folks if you feel like it'll be a safe, non contentious relationship. What can I do to help you more? Help me help you. That is just a conversation that gets going to ensure that your folks are engaged. They're, uh, you know, fulfilled. Maybe they want to do a shadow project that they're scared to talk about because they don't know how you'd react to it. If you ask them and you say, I'm just interested and in connecting with you, I wanna know what's going on with you. That opens up just the approval to have those conversations. Help me help you. What makes you wanna jump, jump out of bed in the morning? What makes you wanna hit your alarm? Three simple questions that you could ask that really, really allow you to connect with your folks. You can go to the next slide. We talked to 101, so I actually jumped the gun a little bit, but come in with an agenda. So what's going well? What challenges are present? Are there any roadblocks you're facing? Is there anything I can do to help you? Is there anything your colleagues can do to help you? Because sometimes it doesn't have to be the supervisor solving every problem. If you have a, a colleague or a subordinate that you know could really be helpful as a coach or a, a co-project manager or something for another person who might be feeling like they're drowning a little bit, pair them up. That, creates that co-collaboration and allows your employees actually to develop more engaged and in, in, in deep relationships as well and trust there. So use your best judgment as a supervisor to understand that you don't have to do everything. What you really should do is focus on what's the best scenario and outcome here for all of the people involved and maybe someone not even involved yet who could help someone more than I can. And for employees, you know, re Track your results. How are you going to do that? Excel, your accomplishment file folder, whatever you want to call it. Um, any customer emails that you want to share and really, you know, not understand how to respond to them. I want your your expertise as my supervisor on this customer management. Right? Come in. Don't hesitate with your concerns. Don't hesitate with your wins, especially because we are humble by nature. Most most people are humble by nature. This is really not the time your supervisor wants to know what you're doing, how it's impactful and how it's significant for your team and for them really at the end of the day, because that's what they're getting rated on. They're getting rating on the outcome of what you are doing. So that's only going to help them shine as well. Ask for that feedback, ask for clarifications. If you see an expectation gap going this way, have it go this way. See a communication gap going this way, 
help it go this way. It's not just your supervisor. You have so much power here as well. And you can go to the next slide. These are just, you know, basic ideas for staying connected, email, instant message, video. The most important thing I want you to take away from this slide is being responsive. You are meant to be as responsive in a remote environment as you would be in the office. Of course, you walk away, people don't know that you're using the bathroom or making up your lunch or anything like that, but you could use, you know, making my lunch on your Outlook or your Teams or whatever it is to showcase why you're not at your desk when they walk, walk by, right? Theoretically, because again, we really don't want to see a huge difference in connection based on just not communicating and going a little bit extra mile for the luxury of being able to telework in a non-pandemic situation. Go ahead. Informally, there's so many great ideas, you know, on this slide, you're gonna get these slides. Another great idea that we've done is, you know, um, one of my supervisor at the beginning of the pandemic said, we're gonna do something called a fika, which is a Swedish tradition of having a baked good and a coffee. We did it every Wednesday at 2 p.m. And it kind of became like a, a, a competition of who made the best baked good that week. It was really fun. It was something our team just culturally, culturally really liked. We could come up with ways that fit the culture of your team to do fun stuff like this. So whatever works for you, think of fun ways to connect informally. It's so important. It could be even a round robin question at the beginning of every staff meeting. What's, you know, what was your favorite thing from this weekend? What's your favorite holiday and why? If you had a superpower, what would it be? Just to get, you know, people are listening and they might not know that someone else has two kids and you have two kids the same age. It kind of just gets the juices flowing between, you know, getting to know each other more informally, inherently. You can move forward. I just wanted to mention a quick, um, before we move on, just for the folks who can't see the slides, um, just some other ideas of asking about everyone's favorite book and then creating a team reading list, everyone's favorite song, creating a playlist, and a, uh, asking about folks' favorite recipes and creating a cookbook from it, a team cookbook. And one of the things um, we heard recently was a team building Tuesdays from someone from F FCN uh, mentioned this and having kind of a team member exchange during uh, your team meetings for team members to learn about what's happening in other team member in other teams and uh, potentially boost collaboration. I just want to note, note that before moving on to the next slide. Thank you. I was freaking out about time, so I'll just- It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, managing teams. Um, this is kind of, I think, where it gets more scary for supervisors when we think of a hybrid work environment, especially when we were not doing any sort of telework or hybrid work prior to the pandemic. I'm gonna have people here, I'm gonna have people there, what am I gonna do? It's gonna be a lot, right? It's gonna be a lot. However, there are strategies that if you're proactive about those gaps that can occur in communication, expectation, contention, that will make this so much easier for you on the back end. So again, be available and responsive. That is leading by example. Make that time to check in, 15 minutes, bi-weekly, have it on the calendar, right? Have a weekly staff meeting where everyone's on teams and has the ability to go through their agenda for the week, resource requests, a, a variety of things, establish opportunities for everyone to share what they're working on. That could happen in that staff meeting as well. Team building Tuesdays is on here, close virtual team building activities. Promote culture that employees reach out for one-on-one -on -one conversations with new hires. We do this on my team. We've had six new hires in the last like two years. They meet with every single person in our division one-on-one -on -one to talk about, no matter if you're a GS five, seven, nine, you're meeting with a new person. And it just really gets, you know, the, the culture of everyone's important, everyone's impactful. Let's spread that. Um, being open to new forms of task and people management. So maybe we need to do that team charter. Maybe we need to look at it a lot more often in the first three months that it's in you know, into fruition, but we're going to get used to it. That is change. If we put it into, you know, manifest it into uh, fruition, it's going to make the change that we want to happen. Sharing project plans, having shared drives, having shared folders, the right uh, type of team norm set up, that's all going to help managing teams. Google search this. If this presentation was too quick, type in managing teams into Google, type in managing hybrid teams into Google. I've seen seven you know, different articles this week on great ways to manage hybrid teams sent to me from either colleagues or, or customers or other people in my inbox. So, and Jonathan, I know you're on the line. Um, I know you've been a remote manager. I've actually been a remote employee since 2016. So I've had a, man, a, a manager, you know, who's also been remote, but you're in the room talking to us. My manager is not. 
you've been a remote manager since before the pandemic and what are some ways that you have created a team culture in a remote setting that we might have not discussed yet today? Great. <laughs> oh, getting some echo. Uh, okay. So just for awareness, I became a remote supervisor back in 2018. And at the time I had 10 employees that were reporting to me. I had been on site for five years with them and just needed to make the transition personally for my, my family situation. And to me, it was a, a concerning experience. I wanted to make sure that the culture stayed the same with the team, that they had open access to me throughout that period. And in order to get there, I, I started by really reflecting on what time I had available to the team and how our connections were made before I transitioned into a remote experience and realized that a lot of the time that I was in the office, I was in one-on-ones with my door closed. I was in different meetings with someone in another building across the campus or you know, in a, a different area. And the interactions that we had were all very intentional. So that was one of my, my core values in making that transition was just to make sure that I had scheduled time with each of the employees. Every two weeks, we would meet for an hour and I maintained that when I transitioned and just continued to make myself available to them whenever needed. And I think for those that are in a situation where you may be transitioning to a remote or, or hybrid experience in the future, make sure that you try to maintain the culture that you have today or when you were back on site. But the, the biggest challenge really, as Lauren was talking about, is when you're dealing with hybrid situations. And for us, that looks like staff meetings. Uh, where we would have some of the folks in the room and some people on the phone. So one tip that I would just leave folks with is to include seven seconds of silence whenever you're making a big statement and you want to have opportunities to get feedback. Uh, it's a little bit awkward at first. You can just say, hey, I'm doing the obligatory seven seconds of silence. But for folks on the phone or if you're using a telephone to call in, sometimes you need that time to unmute or for the introverted staff on the team, they may need a little bit of time to process before they're able to tag in and provide feedback. So I think, Lauren, you've, you've covered it well. Uh, really, it, it's just about trying to find ways to continue to connect both formally and informally. Thanks, Jonathan. Great, great tips. All right, I'll pass it back to Kim. Thanks so much. So we're a little bit behind, so we're going to speed up a little bit here, but thanks so much for all the great information. We're going to move on to effective communication and meetings. We've started talking about this already. Katie Miller, the manager of strategic communications at the Office of Shared Solutions and Performance Improvement in GSA is going to be talking about this, and I'm going to hand it over to Katie now. Thank you so much, Kim. And uh, I just, kudos, when you reach out about this event, I did not fully expect uh, this and, and hearing all these great speakers today and, and seeing all these great questions. So thank you, uh, awesome work. Okay, I only have 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to speed through a couple of these things, but then I'll linger on the chat a little bit uh, to answer any questions you guys may have. So in my day job, I do communications, both internal and external, and that does include social media uh, for performance.gov and for the president's management agenda. But today I'm going to focus on some just general strategies for communication, particularly with your colleagues and those that you work most closely with. So the slide notes leadership here, but I would say that good communication starts with you and it starts with me. Uh, we really need, particularly in this remote environment to develop those relationships to work with one another. In my current role, I started remote and uh, it was interesting trying to get to know everyone and, and build those relationships virtually. Uh, I was able to do that by using video where possible, setting up small 15 minute coffees, virtual coffees, and, and really trying to pick up the phone uh, and or Zoom or chat where appropriate to make sure that I'm connecting with someone. Uh, leadership definitely should support the need for effective communication. And it's really key, like Lauren was saying in the last conversation, that if you are a leader, if you are a supervisor or project team lead, that you do demonstrate that two-way communication, that you are open to that dialogue, that you demonstrate act active listening. 
which means uh, asking questions to confirm your understanding, making sure you're giving people space. Um, but that will go a long way, particularly in this virtual environment that we all find ourselves in. Um, hosting regular points where people, you get updates from you or you can get updates from them. Here we mentioned town halls. It's just one example uh, would be very helpful for that. And finally, we talk about the right method of communication for our, each situation. Well, what does that mean? Well, when we're all doing work and we're all doing projects, I think we sometimes forget uh, that some of our first and most important stakeholders are our colleagues, right? Uh, and those we work with in these situations. And they may have um, their own workload to contend with, or maybe their own priorities that they're focused on. And so whether you're talking to them, whether you're reaching out to another agency to try to collaborate, it's important to think through what your audience, who your audience is, right? What their motivation might be and what you want to communicate to them. And we don't always think about that day to day. So I encourage you sometime uh, today or tomorrow in a meeting to take a step back and say, what am I really trying to communicate here at this check-in, at this project management thing? Um, once you really clearly define who your audience is and say, I am trying to get this interagency collaboration happening. I'm talking to you know, people at the VA who are focused on X and I need them to accomplish Y, then you're better able to kind of problem solve and, and think about ways that you can engage with them in a productive way. Okay, and consistency is key here. So there's a couple of things. Once you know your audience, draft your message. Make sure it's in plain language. I know we all love acronyms, we all use them. Maybe we don't love them, but we use them. Uh, try to avoid that where possible, particularly if your audience uh, is from a different agency who might not have the same lexicon or dictionary of, uh, <laughs> of, of these, these letters strung together that you may have, um, if you're definitely talking to the public or someone in a different uh, government environment, or even just a different shop, uh, I've worked at HUD, I've worked at GSA, I've worked with FCC, and each one, even within themselves, had different languages or different um, terms for things. And sometimes either defining it or trying to use plain language wherever possible uh, will be just be more productive for everybody. And then finally, measuring success. Um, this is if applicable, but let's say you're doing a project and say, I want to start a newsletter. Well, if you're doing a newsletter, you should have a very specific audience in mind, and then you should be using Gov Delivery or a different uh, platform where possible, where they can collect metrics on how many opens, uh, how often it goes out, uh, how many people are taking a look and clicking at links, and different things like that. If we can shift to the next slide. Perfect. Okay, I think if there's anything I know that will be helpful or that I would like you to leave with today, it's uh, our meetings now are more important than ever because this is a way we're now interacting with one another. And uh, this is how we kind of get work done and move things forward. So a couple things, uh, set the tone. If it's a really key meeting or you're really looking for key speakers, don't be afraid to you know, ask for video if comfortable or set that expectation. Um, if you're a supervisor or team leader, perhaps you can say, hey team, like on these team build Tuesdays is something I heard, you know, we're doing cameras on and the rest of the time, that's okay, right? Just kind of set those expectations. Um, making sure that you start with everyone muted and that you come with an agenda. Uh, it's okay to make small talk. In fact, that's really good, like coming with a question or spending a couple minutes talking at the top, particularly in this environment, can be very helpful. But make sure that's not your whole meeting, right? You should have an agenda and a clear purpose for meeting. So why are we here? What are we doing today? This is what we want to achieve. That does two things for you. One, make sure that you're not wasting other people's time and your, your own time, right? Um, but two is trying to signal to them what you are collectively achieving. 
So I often, um, I work across multiple agencies a lot. And again, people have different priorities and maybe coming from things from a different perspective. And so if you can state your purpose at the top of each meeting, um, particularly if you think it may be contentious, that will help you say we're here for a collective purpose. Uh, make sure that if you can share the agenda and any discussion questions or any materials prior to the meeting. So people can theoretically uh, show up prepared to have the discussion that you're hoping uh, for or to achieve the outcome or the decision, right, that you're hoping for. Often when I'm leading meetings or facilitating them, I will say objective, and then I will note what we're covering. And by that, I will say decision point, discussion, next steps, right? And so at each stage, people know, okay, we're talking about this to kind of start teasing this out. Okay, cool, we need to make a decision here, right? Trying to be that specific will be very helpful. Uh, make sure that there are next steps at the very end and that one, not only everyone has access to all the materials we just talked about, but two, everyone's very clear on those next steps. Uh, something that we do uh, within my team is that we do shorten the meeting length. So we try not to have ones past an hour and I should really say 50, 55 minutes because there may be an option depending on your platform. Uh, we get to use Google, but even on Outlook, I think you can set default meeting times and we do that from 15 minutes, right? Um, or even if we're doing a half hour, it's approximately 25 minutes. So if I'm scheduling a meeting, it should be from 2 to 2.25, and that gives me time to kind of prep or shift into the next Zoom call. I don't know if you guys have had this, but I've definitely experienced where you're like back to back to back to back, uh, particularly in this virtual environment, and it's really hard to kind of shift your brain or even take a quick snack break. All right, next one. Again, I'll speed through this, but I'm seeing some great stuff in the chat so I can answer questions. Um, I think I highlighted the objective. One of the other things that has been really beneficial when I'm facilitating or hosting a meeting is to really kind of set the ground rules uh, for what is acceptable or what you're expecting of the people that are together in that environment with you, right? So. During the start of the meeting, remind folks to join you know, in this area, remind themselves to mute them after speaking. If you want people to raise your hand, note that. But I would even say, and beyond these here, um, if you're expecting, like if you want discourse, but you're expecting some tension, you know, just remind people that we're, we're gonna give each other time to hear one another's perspectives. And so please keep your comments brief and to the point. And then, you know, we may interrupt you to go to the next person to make sure we're all heard today. Uh, using some of those things, uh, parking lot, for example, can also be really helpful when you're trying to make sure everyone on the Zoom can participate and has time to be heard. Okay. Um, ways to engage everyone. So I just mentioned a couple saying we're gonna give you time you're gonna have a facilitator. Um, if you can have a colleague or a neutral person come in and facilitate sometimes, uh, that would be very helpful, particularly with contentious meetings. Another tip for meetings where you're trying to set a certain outcome or you're trying to prepare things for people, and I actually did this today, in fact, um, I picked up the phone or I said, I chatted with someone and I said, do you have a couple minutes to talk? And they were like, yeah. And I was able to say, hey, I'm about to push send on this email, but here's, you know, here's why I'm sending this to you and here's what I'm trying to accomplish. And I don't know if that would have come across if I just sent an email. So in this virtual environment, don't be, be prepared to go that extra step and make sure you have that connection. And, and particularly if you're going into a facilitated meeting where there's a lot of people, um, that prep may seem like extra work, but it can be really beneficial uh, to you and to your project or what you're trying to accomplish. If you spend some of that time in advance, making sure everyone has the materials, everyone knows where you're coming from and what the objective is, 
and feels that little, little extra personal attention and care right before you gather them all together. Um, other ways to engage are noted here. So uh, doing active listening, talk about giving feedback, being specific, saying, I appreciated this. I appreciated that Lauren said <laughs> that you are in charge of your own performance plan and can manage, help people manage up, right? Like you can, you can give that specific feedback uh, and make sure that they do feel heard. And then finally, virtual breakout rooms, problem solving <laughs> missions, different things like we've been even utilizing today with polls can all be helpful for you. So I believe I'm at time. I see Kim joining us on the screen. So I will leave you guys with a question. I know we've all done a lot of learning together in the past, I don't know, 18 months. I don't know where we're at anymore. Uh, I think we're headed into junior year of COVID. But if, if you have something that was really helpful for you, uh, communication-wise or virtual-wise, what's, what's your best communication tool? Uh, drop it in the chat. I think we should share and kind of collaborate together. So I'll kick us off and say kudo boards have been very helpful for my team. Uh, so being able to send thank yous with the fun gifts and kind of collect them all together in like a virtual greeting card has been very appreciated by a lot of the people on staff. So if you guys have any other suggestions, we'll love to hear them. And thank you guys for your time. Thank you so much, Katie. I really appreciate it. And we're going to move straight from meetings to uh, training strategies for a virtual hybrid workplace. And Joelle and Jarrett, the Chief Learning Officer and Chief of Organizational Effectiveness at Small Business Association, is going to be uh, covering that material right now. Hey, Kim. Thanks so much. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, thank you for including me in today's panel, Kim. Um, super excited to participate and I'm really, really uh, interested in everything that uh, our experts have shared today. Um, in terms of myself, if you're looking at the slides and you see the, the picture that was in the spring, so you know, hence my pink and tan color scheme uh, as for today, I'm rocking my favorite fall green sweater and a beaded necklace in honor of Indigenous Peoples Month, um, just to talk a little bit about uh, DEIA. Um, but about me, I am the Chief Learning Officer and Chief of Organizational Effectiveness for the U.S. Small Business Administration. Much of what Lauren uh, talked about this morning uh, falls onto my plate at SBA. So thank you so much, Lauren, for all that you've shared and for our other panelists as well. Um, we are going to talk about all of that, but in the learning environment. Okay, so we're really going to talk about how to make sure that the learning that's going on in your organizations is the most effective for your workforce. Uh, and the first most important thing is that you really take action uh, to be deliberate in transforming your training. 70-20-10 uh, still works. Uh, and by that, what I mean is that it is still a true, uh, a true rule of thumb that 70% of the way adults learn is really through experience. It is through doing, whether it is OJT or gamification or online seminars, uh, sorry, online simulations, uh, scenario-based learning or developmental assignments. Really, that is going to be the best way for learners to learn. So making space in our organizations for that is important. 20% of how we learn is really through others, and that's in your developmental relationships. I was very encouraged to, to hear uh, the, the coaching reference today. Coaches and mentors are critical in our organizations. Uh, and if you don't have a coach or you don't have a mentor or you're like, what's the difference? You should check it out. Um, it's, a great, it's a great addition to your learning strategy. And then 10% just 10% of how we learn is really through formal training. And the uh, disheartening thing is that we forget about 90% of what we learn in a formal learning environment, unless you put strategies in place to reinforce that learning. And those strategies are found in the other 90% of the, the model. So either through application or again, learning through others. Um, that can also be informal learning groups, your communities of practice, for example. At SBA, we have a supervisory community of practice that we use to regularly reinforce 
the learning that we push out to our supervisors and to give them a forum, a safe place uh, to kind of be able to noodle scenarios that they're working through uh, and get some learning from their peers, uh, people who've already been there, done that. Um, active learning really does promote knowledge transfer and learning engagement. So you want to make sure that you are giving folks that um, opportunity to really engage. Another thing that's going to engage your work, your learners, is to provide them a roadmap. I want you to think for a minute of the worst class that you've ever sat through or the worst learning experience you've had. And I'll bet you dimes to donuts that it was a scenario where you really didn't know where the instructor was going. You didn't know what they were gonna talk about. You didn't know what the outcomes were. Um, giving your students a roadmap, uh, whether it's through learning objectives or an agenda or whatnot is going to help uh, negate that barrier, okay? And maximizing student participation is exponentially more important uh, in the virtual environment because that's another way that you're going to engage them. So virtual polls like we used earlier today, um, whiteboards and breakout rooms and, and the opportunities for Q&A are also um, really paramount in, in the virtual and hybrid learning environments. And then finally, minding the time. Um, eight hour trainings, eight hour training days, that's not a thing in the virtual hybrid work environment. As, as human beings, um, our attention span doesn't work like that when we're engaging uh, via a virtual environment. And so it really is essential that you break the learning down into chunkable uh, consumable components, um, which I've got some examples, there we go. Um, so when you're tailoring the learning environment, or sorry, the learning to fit the environment, um, not only are you breaking it down, but again, you're taking out anything that is kind of superfluous. You're going to really identify the critical learning objectives, those things that are most essential to what you're trying to get your learners to take away. And then you're going to make sure that you validate your teaching strategy against those critical objectives. And then you're going to adapt those objectives uh, into consumable chunks. Um, maybe you're gonna use micro learning. Uh, maybe you're gonna use response learning websites. Uh, a great example of a response learning website is Kahoot. Kahoot is something that uh, allows you to do like online surveys and uh, different little learning games, things like that. I think, it's, I think it's number five on the list of response learning websites, but it's a tool. It's a tool, uh, and I think it was, I think it was Andrew who shared the tools earlier today. Um, if, if you haven't made friends with your CIO uh, and their team, please do, uh, because they are going to be essential uh, in making sure that you're util utilizing the absolute best technology tools you have at your disposal um, to really transform your training and to pick the right modality based on the content and the criticality of the learning whether it is um, live virtual, sorry about that, whether it's live virtual classroom training, which is gonna be best for discussion and an application environment for application of learning, um, or whether it's something that can be better taught through interactive PDFs or online guides. When we're doing our return to work, when we're doing our ethics training and our other compulsory trainings, you know, those lend themselves to online learning or to interactive PDFs. And, um, Go ahead. No matter what we're doing in those cases, we want to make sure um, that they are consumable. Okay, so if it's not going to be a live virtual environment, you want to make sure that those interactive PDFs or those online learnings are going to be 508 compliant. Okay, you always want to keep that in, in the forefront of your mind. And you want to make sure that no matter what modality you're learning, you're going to be picking, um, you really are keeping in mind um, inclusivity uh, with regard to your training design. And by inclusivity, I mean um, taking into consideration your learning audience, okay? Who are your learners? What are their experiences? What do they already know? Um, when, where, and how are they going to be accessing this learning? Part of the Small Business Administration's mission includes a disaster component, and we are consistently having to take into consideration that our learners 
are going to be consuming our training in lots of different environments, some of them in very inhospitable environments. And so in those cases, it absolutely plays into how we design um, that learning for that, that virtual and hybrid workforce. And then you also want to make sure um, that you remove any unconscious bias. And one of the best ways that you can do that is by really engaging others in the design and beta testing of your learning solutions. So by pulling together a diverse group of people, um, and diverse can mean many things. They can be accessing the training different ways. They can bring their diverse backgrounds to the training environment. Um, but you wanna pull those folks together in the design and beta testing to make sure that um, you've worked out any potential barriers. Um, and when you're considering the plan for potential technology limitations, that can really help. Um, another thing that can really help in, in minimizing potential barriers to the learning are, are things like minimizing streaming video. Um, I'm sure you all have already noticed, uh, Kim did a phenomenal job of really minimizing the use of graphics in this particular uh, learning. Uh, and this was with a 508 compliance in mind, right? Um, minimizing stre streaming video, using screenshots or animated PDF instead of video can help you with bandwidth challenges. Um, providing material offline so that people who can't actually connect to a webinar or who have to engage via phone are able to consume the learning as well. And then absolutely making sure that you're using the right method of communication for your audience um, to suit the type of training. All of those are really important. Um, and finally, if you go back one, um, starting with the end in mind, making sure that whatever learning you're pushing out is aligned to the mission is gonna set you up for success. Um, and doing that, you can use a, a competency-based learning strategy that it addresses your mission critical uh, occupational competencies. Uh, I know uh, Jonathan from NIH, we have benchmarked the heck out of NIH. They've got a very robust, very robust uh, competency dictionary. We've provided links to that here in the, in the presentation, um, but not just NIH, um, OPM, has uh, Mosaic, but they also have all of the uh, competencies for the executive or qualifications. So you've got 27 competencies associated with the uh, SES ECQs so that you're developing your leadership and strength. Um, but then you also wanna make sure um, that you go back to the beginning where Riz kind of began with that organizational culture discussion and making sure that you are um, rolling out a strategy that really promotes a learning culture. And that includes a strategy that affords opportunity for reflective self-assessment and continuous learning. Uh, again, Lauren, thank you for the, um, the IDP reference. Career paths, IDPs, mentoring, coaching, all of those things um, help ensure training success, um, actually in, in any training environment, but particularly where we find ourselves in this virtual hybrid environment. These are all strategies for success. And the final slide that I have here is just some of the resources that I used, um, most of the resources that I used um, that I pulled from to give you this presentation. And I hope I stuck to 10 minutes. I tried really hard. You did great. And I'm sorry that we're a little behind. So, um, but I just, I'm gonna move on to the next presenter, but thank you so much, Joanne. And if folks have questions for Joanne, if you just put it in the chat and we'll get back to you with your, with your with the answers to those questions. I'm gonna move on now thinking about training. Some of the training that agencies are required to do is uh, ethics training. And we have two more sections left in the summary and we're gonna try to um, speed it up a, a little bit to fit everything in. So we'll do five minutes each about if we'll stick to that for the next sessions if possible. So the next one is on ethics strategies for the hybrid workplace and Stuart Bender, the director of USDA Office of Ethics is gonna be presenting this session. So I'm gonna hand it over to Stuart. Thank you, Kim, and I want to thank you. First of all, can you hear me? Yes, yep, come in. Wonderful. It's always good to be heard and seen. So I want to thank Kim for putting this together. She really has done an incredible amount of work, and I just, my hat's off to you. Really thank you for all this great work, and thank you all for being a part of this to all the other presenters. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. So what I want to tell you, and I'm going to go very quickly because I want to give you the summary version. So this is just the meat. I'm going to get rid of all the fluff and just have the meat. There are five unwritten rules 
in the ethics area, and they apply to, to, to everybody. And they apply even more so in the hybrid work environment. And here's what they are. And they will, you will not find these written down anywhere, but these are reality. They're like gravity. It will affect you no matter whether you acknowledge it or not. The first is that trust is everything and ethics is a big part of it. Second is one ethical misjudgment can undo all your good work. So all the hard work you're doing can be really undone with one mistake. And all employees, all federal employees have ethics related responsibilities. We all are responsible for doing our part and playing our role uh, in, in, in the federal government and for being ethical and for being impartial. Supervisors, if you're a supervisor, you have additional responsibilities that are imposed by regulation that you may not be even aware about, uh, but you are responsible for that. And there are ethics resources that, that I and my team have created that we have made available to every uh, federal agency, which you can use now. And they're specifically uh, perfect for the hybrid and virtual work environment. You can use them right away today. Let's go to the next slide. So um, I think you may need to um, add some more, I'm not sure if there's more text there. There it is, okay. So um, actually, I think you will need to go back one. Nope, you're going forward. Okay, there it is, perfect, stay right there, thank you. So let's talk about trust is everything and ethics is a big part of it. There was a Pew Charitable Trust survey in 2018 where they asked uh, the, uh, the public, and they had a number of uh, public and private entities and they said, which one would have the highest level of trust? And the highest level of trust uniformly was elementary school principals. And so if you are a manager, if you're a supervisor, you wanna to think to yourself, what are some of the characteristics of elementary school principals that would elicit trust? And what comes to mind is that they are actively engaged in their school, you see them walking in the hallway, that they are seen as impartial and fair. They are the arbiters of myriad disputes. And that they are, and this is the most important one, that they're motivated by the best interests of others. Everybody uh, can remember their elementary school principal. Uh, I remember mine as being very tall because I was probably very short at the time in first grade. Um, but um, they're motivated by the best interests of their students, their faculty, and others. It leads to the next part, which is that one ethical misjudgment can undo all your good work. So if you're a supervisor, don't underestimate the effect of even one unintentional ethics lapse, either by you or your staff, because it can snowball. It can lead to FOIA requests, unwanted news stories, potential um, Office of Inspector General investigations, uh, all sorts of things which can divert time and attention from your work and bring you unwanted attention and does not give you enough time to do the work you need to do. There's a wonderful quote by Warren Buffett that says, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to lose it. It's really true, be very careful. I wanna move on to the next slide, and this is the regulation for all employees, that we all have a responsibility to act at all times in the public's interest. And the regulation is at 5 CFR 2638.102, and that's really the key thing, that we need to act uh, so that the public doesn't lose trust and confidence in us, so that we are seen as impartial. Um, and that's really, really key. And there's a test that the impartiality rule uh, uh, requires that if a reasonable person looking in knew of your actions, would they think your actions were okay? I call it the Washington Post test, meaning that if, if, if everything you were doing was written uh, in the Washington Post, would a reader think that you were fine and, and impartial? It's not whether you actually were, it's whether you are perceived that way. Next slide. And for, for supervisors, um, this is gonna be really important. There's a regulation you may not be aware of, you need to look at this one, 5 CFR 2638.103. This applies to all supervisors. And it basically says that if you're a supervisor, you have a heightened personal responsibility for advancing ethics and for being a model of ethical behavior for your subordinates. What that means is, at staff meetings, in your staff emails, in your communicating with your staff, remind your staff that ethics is important. Tell your staff about the ethics rules and make sure that they know who their ethics officer is, that they ensure that their ethics forms are timely completed. And that becomes important because as you message and as you send messages to um, staff, 
you are actually bulletproofing yourself and you are actually um, uh, protecting your department and your agency uh, in case somebody does go rogue, in case somebody does violate a rule. You can then say, look, I've sent emails about how important ethics is. We've talked about this. Everybody knows what the expectations are. Set the bar high. And the other thing is to walk the walk, make sure that your actions are um, consistent with the tone that you set. So you wanna be very, very uh, uh, careful on that. I will tell you another thing that you wanna do is that you wanna effectively leverage the resources that your agency's ethics advisor has. And you really wanna basically, you really wanna make sure if you're a supervisor that your subordinates know what their obligations are and you know who your ethics officials are because you want them to be your allies. At USDA, where I'm, where I'm the head of the ethics office, uh, I let people know how to reach me. I give them my, my personal cell phone number and they can call me and they can reach out to my staff and they can reach out to us and we're very, very available. Uh, but I wanna tell you about some resources on the next slide that we've made available for everybody. The first is USDA is the first agency to have come out with an ethics app and we've made it available to every man, woman and baby in the United States. I don't know how many babies are using it, but I will tell you that over 89,000 people have downloaded uh, the, um, the ethics app. And how do you find it? You go to any smartphone and you, you type in two words, USDA ethics on any smartphone, you can find it. Also, we have created the first, in partnership with NASA, USDA created the first ethics game with avatars. And we've made that available on our website. It's at the USDA Office of Ethics website. Uh, we invite you to play it. It actually complies with all of the OGE requirements. It's a fun a game, it's set in outer space. It combines outer space, exploration, food sustainability, and the ethics rules and diversity. So I encourage you to check out the game. We also have an ethics YouTube channel that has 28 videos on it. You can visit our website and we have ethics training that uh, we put on that website for new employees. These are all great resources that you can use right now. Uh, if you're a supervisor, these are available to you and uh, we've made them available for the entire federal government. So it's not just USDA employees who benefit, but it's everybody. And with that, I've learned that for an ethics talk to be immortal, it need not be eternal. I will turn it over to Kim. Thank you so much, Stuart. I really appreciate it. And um, great, great presentation. We're gonna move on. We just spoke about new employees and uh, Jonathan Lappin is gonna be talking about hiring and onboarding. He's the Chief Strategic Workforce Analytics, Analytics and Engagement Branch at, at NIH uh, and within HHS. So thanks, thank you so much, Jonathan. I'll let you take it from here. Great, thank you, Kim. Uh, so last speaker, I'll try to be brief as we go through this content, uh, but before I get into it, I wanted to just quickly say that it's, it's interesting to see that we have hiring and onboarding at the very end of a presentation. It's the first step in someone's career, so why are we talking about it last? And in addition to that, my background is in employee engagement and retention. I'm not a classification specialist, I'm not a staffing expert, so why me? And I think the answer to that is employee engagement starts before an employee joins the organization. And the first step to that really is that vacancy announcement and that opportunity to be transparent about what that position is. When we think about hiring and we, we as hiring managers go into that process knowing what we think we need and try to find someone that we think will fit that mold, However, during the interview process itself, we're, we're really focused on learning about that candidate. We don't often do a good job about sharing what it's like to work in that position, give information about what they could expect for daily activities. And improper job fit is one of the main drivers for disengagement and separation for a position. So it's critical from the on-site of hiring, it doesn't matter if it's for a remote position, an on-site position, or a hybrid work environment, to be as transparent as possible with the new hires when you make a selection to make sure they fully understand what they're getting into. Now, it's important to know in general, but when we're talking about it from a hybrid and remote workplace, we know things like telework are becoming more a norm in the workplace across the United States and world. And as Kim mentioned earlier, as we start to reduce our limits of a physical location for the workplace, we're able to recruit more geospatially diverse teams and increase diversity and different perspectives in our organization. 
The challenge with that, though, is as we open it up, we often get many more applicants than we have in the past. And I think one of the, the pieces that's ingrained into us as hiring managers and HR professionals is the, the interview process itself. We have to ask every candidate the same questions. And many of us just assume that that process has to be an hour long. It's true that we have to be consistent and fair with how we ask questions. But one way that I've seen that works well to deal with a broad and large candidate base is to select the top candidates and begin with a 15 minute phone screen. Ask everyone the same questions, but in just 15 minutes, three or four questions at the most, you're really able to identify a bit more if you think the person would be a fit in the organization itself. You don't have to get into details about their past experience. That type of conversation helps when you're dealing with such a large candidate pool. Um, I'll be brief here, but another resource we mentioned earlier, the behavioral based interview guides that we have at NIH are public facing. We have 118 different competencies for various positions at NIH. And what that resource is down at the bottom is a series of questions for each competency. We have about 10 different questions that are behaviorally based. Basically, it encourages the STAR approach from the interview candidates, which talks about the situation, task, action, result, which that helps really get a better sense of whether or not that employee has experience in the area that you're trying to recruit for. So I'd always recommend that. It's public facing and it's available to everyone. So link is down at the bottom. Now, onboarding. When we look at onboarding, as Alex mentioned earlier, in a virtual environment, equipment, tools, and resources are vital to success. New employees, when they first come on board, don't often have a full understanding of what's available to them or what they should be asking for. So it's essential as a hiring manager or HR professional that you help to inform the new hire of what they can ask for and what is provided to them. When so developing a well thought out plan of key information meetings outlined for their employees first few weeks. So being very brief on this one, Kim, uh, when somebody comes on board, often they know generally what they're supposed to do. They don't know who their contacts are, when they have scheduled meetings for those first few weeks. So giving them a document, which is basically a quick onboarding plan, will save you as a hiring manager significant time not having to meet constantly with the, the new employee in their first few days to help get them set up and give them the authority to reach out to their future colleagues. So it helps them start to build relationships, which is essential in the onboarding process and ultimate success of the employee in the long term. Last thought that I'll, I'll leave you with here is in a virtual environment, as we've mentioned, relationship building tends to be the most difficult component for someone that doesn't have opportunities to connect for those informal conversations. I think we've gotten some good examples of ways to tackle that. But as you bring new hires on, one of the, the key aspects of being a supervisor of a virtual or remote employee is to make sure that you allow them time to be able to do that in their job. I'll keep it brief. So all done, Kim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm sorry for the, the rush at the end, but please do let us know if you have any questions. I love that I see you establish a peer mentor too. Really great ideas. And just want to thank everyone today. I'm going to quickly go through a summary. Uh, so what we heard today, some uses and benefits of telework for the organization. We see uh, associated, it's associated with higher employee performance, retention, and engagement. Uh, cost savings, also providing the government with a, comp a competitive edge for hiring and retaining top talent, supporting employees with medical needs, and also facilitating continuity of operation during emergencies. Uh, also uses for and benefits for employees, saving time and money, potentially supporting work-life balance and better health. I did uh, receive some information from folks just simply like uh, something as simple as I was able to take my daughter to her ballet practice. That was one thing I I saw in, in a note about work-life balance and uh, really some great things and in, in, uh, the reduced commute time. Uh, also for the environment resulting in less energy use, cleaner air, lower greenhouse gas emissions, for the public reduced commute time in congested areas, and also potentially better health from cleaner air. For the strategies, we've heard a lot of incredible strategies today for effective telework and hybrid work. I think we've heard a resounding uh, thought on trust is everything. Lead by example, create a culture of, uh, built on trust, accountability, ethics, 
psychological safety, inclusion, equity, diversity, accessibility, and continuous learning. Uh, that quote from Stewart's talk, act at all times in the public's interest, I think is incredibly important. And also federal employees need to be trustworthy and need to trust each other to be successful and for the public to trust us. Teleworking and non-teleworking employees should act and perform equally and be treated equitably. Perform the same way, be evaluated in the same way, example by their performance and results, and be awarded in the same way. Uh, also, communicate, 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 communicate effectively and clearly, maintain connection with colleagues and, and teammates. Also, establish clear expectations, uh, clear performance expectations with SMART goals, uh, establish team and individual norms for commuting, uh, communication, meetings, et cetera, uh, and be careful to establish boundaries and other techniques to maintain work-life balance. And the final slide here, work. Just as a reminder, work is what you do, not where you are. So thanks, everyone.